Hello, everyone. So I, like many people, uh, have been following the Depp Heard mutual defamation cases for the last six weeks or so. As I'm recording this, uh, it's the Thursday before the last day of the trial, and the attorneys are currently uh, going over jury instructions, which, <laughs> for me anyway, is really interesting. Um, but uh, we did have some testimony just yesterday. Uh, which was incredibly interesting from my perspective, and I decided why not go over a video um, expounding on some of the uh, the finer points here in the testimony and explaining some of the things that unfortunately the expert, due to the context, wasn't really able to, to follow through on. So just so you know uh, where I'm coming from, uh, from this perspective, I am a professor of cybersecurity. Uh, my specialty is actually in digital forensics. I teach digital forensics at both an undergrad and a graduate level. I've been a digital forensics practitioner for many years now. My specialty in terms of research is actually forensic iconography, which is the study of visual images for forensic artifacts. And uh, that's what prompted me to make this video because actually somebody who is themselves an iconographist, although they don't use the term, that's really more of an academic term than anything else. Uh, they do uh, exactly the same kinds of things that I do. Um, and uh, I watched the testimony when it happened live and it was terribly interesting, but there were a number of things that uh, they just couldn't because of the courtroom setting uh, expound on when you're providing expert testimony. Um, particularly in a court situation, as opposed to a recorded uh, testimony in a deposition, um, you have uh, virtually no leeway in uh, answering the questions. You answer the questions that you are asked. It's not your job as the as the expert witness to guide the attorneys to the proper conclusion. Uh, you're there merely to present findings. And if you were to read this gentleman's report, as if you were to repeat re read the report of any of the experts that that tes uh, testified in this trial, uh, you would find. A tremendous amount of detail that they simply are not able to go into on the stand. Um, so I can, however, on this YouTube channel, and um, I would like to just kind of go through it and show from, from my perspective as a practitioner, I am certified in forensic work. Um, I do hold multiple certifications for cybersecurity, but one in particular for cyber forensics. Um, and uh, I do have an educational background in this as some of my research is in this particular area. I specialize in multimedia evidence analysis. So images, video, text, that kind of a thing, human technology, interaction, and forensic artifacts. Um, so the topics that are being discussed are, are things that I, I research and deal with every day. Um, and, uh, as a, uh, computer criminologist. Um, I'm also very familiar with the legal process. So I think that, I don't know, maybe I might have something interesting to note here is all. So um, I'm actually going to play the video. Uh, there were a few pauses in the proceedings uh, during the, uh, the, the testimony here. I'm going to skip through those um, and I'm not necessarily going to air the entire testimony, although we'll see how far we get. Uh, but mostly I wanted to just kind of find spots where I might be able to to opine here. So I'm going to turn the audio up so that we can hear what's going on. Good afternoon, Mr. Neumeister. Good afternoon. Could you please state your full name for the record? It's Norbert, N-O-R-B-E-R-T, Brian, I go by Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Neumeister, N-E-U-M-E-I-S-T-E-R. Um, could you start by describing, describing your educational background, please? My educational background, well, I graduated from Cal State University Northridge 42 years ago with a degree in political science. Um, from then on, I've been working professionally in photography, totally unrelated, uh, for the past 42 years. Uh, and that would also include videography audio and a few other different uh, binary related tests. Where do you currently work? Uh, I own uh, USA Forensic. What is USA Forensic? All right, so I, just to, to break in here a little bit, what the uh, attorney is doing, this is, this is perfectly normal for expert testimony. When you first take the stand, they ask you to state your name for the record, other pertinent details. What they're trying to do is qualify this witness as an expert. Now, um, myself, uh, my undergraduate degrees are in uh, political science and social science. So actually, uh, Mr. Neumeister and I have that in common. Uh, my master's degree is in criminology, my um, PhD in cybersecurity. Um, I also have 
certifications in cybersecurity and forensics. I have experience in both research and uh, in uh, practical application of both forensic work and cybersecurity work. Um, so when I look at the credentials of someone like Mr. Neumeister, the question is, in, in my mind, you know, is this person qualified or would I consider them qualified? Um, for other professions, other disciplines, um, perhaps not. And I'm not here to make any legal determinations. None of this is, is a professional opinion necessarily. All of this is my personal opinion. Um, but uh, other disciplines have gold standard certifications. They have uh, minimum educational requirements and whatnot. Uh, the field of cybersecurity in general, but in particular digital forensics, is not so. So the, the field of cybersecurity has been codifying, has been professionalizing over the years. There are gold standard certifications. There are educational paths. The same is also true for digital forensics. And when you note that I'm mentioning cybersecurity and digital forensics in the same breath, uh, I'm actually discussing the field of information assurance. And digital forensics often fits under the field of uh, information assurance in the after action incident, post incident work. So digital forensics is not just for law enforcement. Every organization should be doing some measure of digital forensics. Now, that means that digital forensics is a niche field of cybersecurity or information assurance. So when I mention the two in the same breath, that's why. And as a niche field, uh, there's even fewer educational paths and, uh, and standard gold standard certifications that one would expect to have for a practitioner. Now, the fact that Mr. Neumeister does not have any certifications to me is a bit of a red flag. But as I said, it's not entirely unusual for somebody to be considered an expert but not have those things in these fields. Mr. Neumeister, his undergraduate degree is pretty much irrelevant. I believe that even he would say that it is. However, he has many decades of experience as a photographer and a videographer, which also, in my opinion, does not qualify him as an expert in digital forensics. But he does own his own company. Uh, they have been, he has been practicing in the private sector um, as an independent contractor for even the government in these cases. Um, so he has been doing the work and that, in my opinion, uh, certainly qualifies one as an expert, provided that they are able to fulfill the requirements of the Daubert test or the Kumo Tire Extension, and that all of the methods that they employ in order to arrive to their conclusions are of sound and accepted techniques and tools and practices, um, which as we see throughout his testimony, that does seem to be the case. So is he qualified as an expert? <clears throat> yes, it would be nice, of course, uh, for an expert witness to have an educational background or to have certifications um, in the field or to be a member of certain scientific organizations, which um, Mr. Neumeister in a moment, we'll, we'll mention that he, he, in fact, is a member of several such organizations, but not the ones that I would expect, but we'll get there in a moment. USA Forensic is a digital forensics company. We are boutique. We're very small. We work, um, we have offices in Grove Point Farms, Michigan, and in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we work with varying types of clients because to us, data is data, and it takes no side. So we can be ending up working for prosecution, defense, law enforcement, the Innocence Project. We have a contract with the Department of Defense. We do classified and unclassified work. We've done classified work with various agencies. We've worked with DOJ, and I've worked in 23 countries as a photographer. So um, just to break in again here, so what he's describing as far as Forensic USA, I hope I'm getting that name right, I may have may have botched that, but um, it's a little bit odd, his answer to me, uh, as far as this being his qualification. So as I just said, I, I'm not about to perjure myself here, um, but um, he said that he works for a fairly small organization, boutique, um, which is not unusual. Uh, starting up your own forensics firm or any cybersecurity firm uh, is totally fine, totally doable. Um, the fact that he has large clients uh, is also not really a red flag for me. Uh, I, how a small organization is able to get these things? Well, there's a, there's a lot of forensic work to do. <laughs> there truly is. Um, and there's so few people out there to do it that it, it's not difficult to get, um, you know, occasional work that spills over in, in these cases. But his definition of a contract may be different than mine. When I hear that you've gotten a contract from these people or, or you've been engaged by these people, it may be on a case-by-case -case basis, which means he may have only been contacted by the DOJ one time, and it might have been a referral 
um, you know, from, you know, some smaller work associated with the case or something like that. But the way he's characterizing it, and I have no reason to believe, uh, not to believe Mr. Neumeister, you know, it seems as if they are regularly engaged with these people, um, that they, they are, although a small outfit with only two, uh, two offices, which are geographically disparate, which I also find to be a little bit odd, but in any event, um, I have no reason to believe that, that they're not engaging with these people on a regular basis and that they're doing this kind of work. Um, his answer, however, at the end is that he's also worked in 23 company, uh, sorry, he's also worked in 23 countries as a photographer. Again, being a photographer does not make you a forensic expert. You can be a photographer and not be able to do any forensic work on photographs. Um, but I believe that it is relevant given the scope of his testimony. Uh, he is not here to testify on the authenticity of any evidence that is very clear. Although his, the attorneys in their line of questioning do try to steer him in that direction. He does correctly identify that none of the images in this case can be authenticated. So he is only testifying, uh, on the, uh, apparent, um, alterations that have been done to the images. And I would say that being a photographer, somebody who uses image editing software as part of their profession, um, and makes, uh, such adjustments, image enhancements, we'll call them, um, it is, is sound, uh, it, that is sound experience anyway. What's your title at USA Forensic? Uh, CEO. Did you also found USA Forensic? Originally in around 1990, it was called Skymeister. And that is because of my, the amount of helicopter photography time I have, um, <laughs> About, 20, about 10 years ago, we changed it to USA Forensic while still doing a lot of the same tasks. And you described, I think, some of the entities that you work with. Um, what kind of work do you do for those entities that you mentioned? We do uh, audio forensics, which is clarifying audio, for example, sting operations or uh, audio that may have been picked up on surveillance or any other type of recording, removing background sounds, video clarification. We do a lot of work with axon no, cameras. Checked on relevance based on the discussion we had earlier. This experience has absolutely nothing to do with anything. All right. Do you have an objection to him being moved in as an expert in the field? Well, th she hasn't moved yet. I'm objecting to the relevance of the testimony on the subject matter right now. I'll overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. So what happened right there is um, opposing counsel, in this case, uh, this expert witness has been engaged by uh, Depp's attorneys in this Depp v. Heard um, uh, trial here. Um, the objection came from opposing counsel. So, uh, Amber Heard's side, who was objecting to the relevance of this, um, this is an inappropriate objection because at this point, um, he has not been moved to be accepted by the court as an expert. He's merely stating his credentials and his experience. So the court understands that he does have subject matter expertise over this particular area that he intends to testify to. Um, so to say that his experience is irrelevant is an inappropriate at this point, which is why it was overruled and he was allowed to continue. Go ahead, Mr. Neumeister, you can continue. And, uh, where I left off is uh, we do a lot of work with Axon police cameras because they don't really handle low lux levels or low light levels very well. So we clean up, uh, we are beta testers for a program called Input Ace, which is uh, part of the Axon company used by police officers. We clarify their cameras to better see what happened at night. Uh, um, so He's, uh, he said that he, uh, that his organization, um, is doing forensic work, but that was a big stretch. What he just said. So he says that they do work with Axon, which are, uh, is a brand of, of, uh, uh, that they make the police body cams. So when you see police body cam footage, you'll often see in the corner, it'll say Axon and maybe a model number. Um, that's just the make and model of that particular camera. They make very small portable personal cameras like this. He said that the forensic work that they're doing uh, is reviewing, reviewing and enhancing that footage because they don't handle low light levels very well. But he's saying that the work that they're doing there is they are beta testers for a program that Axon created. That's not for, I mean, they're using it as a, as a potential forensic tool. They're doing image enhancement on it. Uh, but that is, uh, that's not, uh, being, being a beta tester is not really a sign of experience, in, in my opinion. For example, in, in different scenes, we do the same with surveillance cameras, um, any kind of camera, cell phone cameras. We also do uh, cell phone forensics 
computer forensics and cell tower forensics, along with photo uh, photo photographic forensics. What? Okay, so this is the, probably the objection that came from Amber Heard's side would have been avoided entirely if he had simply been more concise. Uh, I'm not here to armchair quarterback this. Um, I mean, I've been in a position where I've had to provide testimony before, and it's an absolutely nerve-wracking process. At least it was for me. Um, you know, uh, and this is perhaps the most high pressure of all such situations. So I'm, I'm not here to impugn Mr. Neumeister's performance or anything, but the uh, more concise answer to the question of what sort of work do you do with Forensic USA uh, was simply what he added there at the end is we do uh, mobile forensics, cell tower forensics, digital video, and uh, whatever other dig audio, I think he said also, uh, forensic work and enhancing and uh, extrapolating, ex uh, examining forensic artifacts. That would be the end of that answer, more or less. What types of cases do you work on? It can be anything from uh, Fortune 500s to, um, uh, it can be anything from a pro per, which is a person that's actually just representing themselves in, in a, in a uh, smaller case, to uh, a lot of homicide cases, um, defamation. Um, it could be any kind of case that requires cell phone extractions, or computer extractions, could be money laundering, could be uh, a department of... So this is another rambling answer that required a more concise answer. So the answer here to what sort of cases does your company work on would simply be any case where digital evidence is involved. End of. Uh, unless your company has specific limitations, then that would be your answer. Um, he's definitely going on and giving answers that aren't really work that his company would, would do, but they're sort of tangentially related here. So, um, you know, or he could just simply say homicide cases, defamation cases, or any other case that requires cell phone extraction or other digital multimedia digital evidence analysis. Department of Defense, identifying a voice, that type of thing. Satellite imagery, and basically anything with binary information. Have you been retained as an expert before? Oh, yes. Um, the last part of that answer was particularly funny. So anything with binary information is is digital evidence. So he gave a long answer, and then at the end, essentially just said, anything that has digital evidence. Um, I would say we average about 150 to 200 cases a year. In the last four years, we've done over 600 cases, and that would be in uh, U.S. federal courts, U.S. district. So just for the record, 150 to 200 cases for a small boutique operation like this is a ludicrous number of cases to handle every single year. Um, I don't know. I don't know the nature, the exact nature of the cases that they handle. Some maybe some of them are extremely simple, or they have some regular work that they're doing. And maybe he's considering every examination of a log or every examination of an after incident report or something to be a case. I don't know what his definition of a case is, uh, but 150 to 200 um, for a small organization with two offices in Michigan and Arizona. Um, that's a lot of cases to handle. So uh, either either he either he himself or his team has an extensive amount of experience or we have we need to define case here i think district courts various state courts throughout um uh, throughout the united states we just wrapped up a case that was an overseas case wrapped up yesterday um we do u.s military court uh, we have a case coming up in front of the u.s supreme court so it it's really very I've done quite a few U.S. District Court cases. Have you testified as an expert in digital forensics before? Yes, um, and what people sometimes don't understand is only about 2% of all cases go to trial. So 98% of the time you're actually just doing the forensic work and giving it to the parties. And as we say, data is data. It really doesn't take a side. We don't have a narrative. So. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely true what he just said. Uh, very few cases, relatively speaking, go to trial compared to the number of them that will go through some phase of the, the pretrial process. Um, giving live deposition like this is, is for an expert witness a fairly rare occurrence, or at least it ought to be a fairly rare occurrence. Uh, typically, when you're an expert witness, the farthest that you will get is perhaps to the deposition phase, where essentially what that means is that you've submitted your report, perhaps it's already been shared in discovery, and you're just providing some form of testimony. Uh, no, no side, neither side, uh, wants to have a witness go to court and not have a pretty good idea of what they're going to say. So you'll give out of court testimony in the form of a deposition, whether that be in person or recorded or what have you. 
um, just so that they can go over your statements and get a pretty good idea of what your position is and how you arrived at those conclusions and, and so on. It just benefits everybody in the legal process. So, um, yeah, uh, very few of them will actually move forward to trial. Um, and uh... Very often it's just providing the data for the attorneys to work with uh, or the parties. Have you ever been excluded from testifying as an expert regarding any work that you performed? No, um, but you have to take into account that sometimes there might be curbs put on what, uh, for example, in this trial, um, there's certain boundaries. Uh, or if you're working with a proper or with a attorney that is not very familiar with electronics. And, and the thing is, again, they teach Latin in law school, not binary and binary is the universal language these days. So sometimes in the legal system, it's a little bit hard to explain to attorneys what exactly we're doing. So we try to break it down and make that work. Yeah, so what he's describing here is, is a serious issue um, in the field of digital forensics and computer investigation, uh, where you have highly technical topics. And they need to be explained at some point in the legal process, those technical topics needed to be handed off to a lay person. Um, so generally the way that this is addressed with, uh, with forensics firms, or at least the way I suggest that they be addressed in forensics firms as an academic who doesn't really have to deal with these things is to have forensics teams, uh, broken out into three phases of an investigation. So you'll have an investigation phase, which will have investigators who are responsible for, uh, going out to the crime scene, doing the evidence collection, doing the chain of custody establishment, um, just ensuring that integrity is maintained. Uh, doing extraction and then essentially handling evidence long-term in the lockup. Then you have an examination phase where you'll have forensic examiners that will take that evidence. They will perform the forensic tests. They will write forensic reports and they will hand all of this information off to a final phase, which is the analysis phase where forensic analysts will come in. They will repeat tests that were performed by examiners to ensure forensic integrity. They will digest the forensic reports and convert them into a more non-technical -tech term which I call a case report. And then they are responsible for conveying the findings in the case report. So the findings of the examiners into a form that is addressable by lay people. And then we provide, of course, in-person testimony. Now, those three phases, the reason I break them up is because they all require very discrete personality types and skill sets. The kind of person who would be, who would excel as an investigator is the kind of person who has amazing attention to detail, uh, who absolutely understands the importance of chain of custody of maintaining integrity and who absolutely is a rule follower, an absolute 100% rule follower. The person who is excellent as an examiner is going to be the kind of person who is very technical, has the, uh, the understanding uh, of what's happening at the, at the bite. And he keeps saying binary over and over again. So let's say at the, at the bit level, um, how forensic artifacts are created, where to find them, how to safely extract them and how to, most importantly, record everything they do to provide into a forensic report, whereas an analyst is really best at synthesizing information, at verifying information, and passing that on to lay people. So that's why I personally break them out into three discrete parts. And actually, Mr. Newmeister here is a perfect example of that. And again, I'm not here to impugn Mr. Newmeister. So if it seems as if I'm doing that, uh, please know that I have absolutely nothing but respect for this witness, at least uh, from what I recall of his testimony yesterday, I wasn't given any reason to believe that he's anything less than an expert. But one thing I do note here and in other places is Mr. Newmeister is at the moment uh, currently attempting to uh, establish uh, to the court that he is indeed an expert, which means he's he's expounding on things that he doesn't need to expound on in order to convey, hey, I'm smart and I know what I'm talking about, which is perfectly fine and understandable under these circumstances. But he keeps saying over and over again, data does not take a side. Well, that is a very examiner point of view to take because to an examiner, data is data. It either is or it isn't. Just like binary, it is a one or it is a zero. But for an analyst point of view, you may know that data doesn't take a side but you damn well know that data can be interpreted in a lot of different ways because people do not understand binary, just like they don't understand that data is not just data. And we're going to see where that trips up quite a bit here in the testimony later on, because it gets very confusing for the jury when the lawyers don't follow along with the data doesn't take a side uh, point of view, right? Because they do have a side. They have taken a side. What is digital forensics? Digital forensics is anything that you are using, like your, your television set, your cell phone, your computer, 
uh, anything that runs off of binary information that has coding in it. Oh, oh, I know this one. Um, I actually go over this all the time in my, my classes. What is digital evidence? So I have this one queued up. So it's a little bit unfair here to Mr. Neumeister. Um, but uh, his definition of digital evidence is a l little bit uh, imprecise in my opinion, but that's okay because the actual definition of digital evidence does not have one established true definition. It depends on who you're asking. Um, so the definition that I like to use is one that was provided by the uh, Swig D, which is a, a, a scientific working group on digital evidence of which I'm a member. Um, I prefer that one uh, because uh, I think it's very concise. Um, their definition is, and this is what I provided my undergrad students as well, as any information of probative value that is either stored, processed, or transmitted in digital form. Um, and I like that because it is better than an other definition. So for example, the International Organization of Computer Evidence, uh, their definition is, a, is a, or was, I can't remember if it's been changed, uh, but was uh, any information that is stored or transmitted in binary form that may be relied upon in court. And I don't like that because binary is just one method of representing data. Um, all data is binary, but all binary can be represented in some other form. And it's better not split hairs in a definition, if you ask me. Something that is concise and simple is the best way to do it. Uh, in addition to that, I used to use a textbook in uh, in one of my uh, previous uh, courses many years ago, um, which was digital forensics. Uh, it was Yogan Casey was the author. I think the title was Digital investigations and computer crime or digital evidence and computer crime can't recall uh, but he had an excellent definition as well which was any data that can establish a fact in an investigation which again small concise and simple um, but the use of data in that one was a bit problematic for me so hence my preference for the sweet d definition of data um, and i like that one because again it is any information of probative value that is either stored, uh, processed, or transmitted in a digital form. And that means that it's going to encompass all digital devices, so any device, whether it can connect to the internet or not, uh, any device, whether it is storing the information or is merely used as a pass-through. Um, well, it encompasses just about everything. And it, it differentiates relevant and irrelevant information because evidence should mean that it's relevant to an investigation. So that's why any information of probative value. Everything else is data, it's not evidence. How long have you worked in digital forensics? Well, I actually started off in analog, so it's been 40 some odd years. I started off as a cameraman. Um, my first cameras were film cameras. When I was a kid, my dad was- So again, Mr. Neumeister is conflating digital forensics or a forensic practitioner with a videographer or a photographer. They're not the same, they're not the same at all, you know? Um, I don't like the answer. I, I understand he's trying to convey his competency. And again, I'm not impugning Mr. Neumeister here, but it's, it's similar to saying, um, how long have you been a chemist and saying, well, I was a chef for 45 years. It, it's not the same at all. That was a director of sales and sales service administration for the NBC television network on the West coast. So I grew up around television cameras. My first cameras were Cameras people might not have heard of, Leica, Hasselblad, cameras like that. I trained with some of the best photographers around at the time, William Walner, Niall Latham, really excellent photographers. And um, I started shooting videotape from helicopters and I logged about 14,700 hours of video. And at that time, oddly enough, since we were the only helicopter, a television helicopter, we were the only helicopter in Phoenix, at the time, the sheriff's, the sheriff's department did not have a helicopter. The police department did not have a helicopter, nor did Aravac. So we ended up doubling up uh, being a news crew as well as an air rescue crew. So again, that's not forensic work. That's, uh, that's journalism and moonlighting as air evac. That's, none of that is forensic work. So as far as forensics, analog probably from 1980 to 1990 and digital from 1990 through current. How'd you get started in it? That's the answer he should have given. That, that's it.
just the analog from 1980 to 1990 and digital from 1990 onwards. That's all he needed to say there. Really by osmosis, I started in the production field. I usually don't uh, do that much TV work anymore. I did do, I did shoot uh, part of an episode, uh, a program called Planet Earth for the BBC last year. I don't normally do television anymore. It's just 99% forensics. But um, I got started because very often as working in the helicopter, um, we'd be asked to work for a police department in a rescue or a chase or whatever the situation might be. And since I'd be videotaping it, they would ask me to break it down frame by frame and analyzing it using a, what's called a time-based corrector in the day. And so um, word got out that I could do unusual things because I'm pretty good with machines. And um, it, it just ended up, it, more and more people started calling and it just became a full-time job. That's a classic story of just about anybody in the information assurance field, whether it's digital forensics or anywhere in security or whatever, um, from the, the early days from the seventies, eighties into the nineties, that's the classic story. Um, almost every long in the tooth grognard, uh, security person I know was like, well, I was the email administrator. And then one day the CIO knocks on my door and says, Hey, you know how to change passwords, right? Well, you're in charge of security now. Um, or, you know, uh, people found out that I could do this. And so it became my job or people started coming to me with it. Um, per, this is a classic story. And again, the field is professionalizing, uh, digital forensics, um, ought to be more formalized. I wish it were. Um, I think it's more important for forensics than it is just for other information assurance disciplines in general. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a, a classic story. So I, again, I, I do believe that Mr. Neumeister is an expert. Um, and that's my personal opinion, um, based on my experience in the field anyway. So you could call it a pseudo professional opinion, but I'm not, I'm, I don't have the information in front of me really to make any professional determination, but he seems credible, he seems to know what he's talking about. And I don't find his story to be unusual at all, um, for someone in this position. This is how it happened. Have you received any professional certifications in forensics? Yes, but again, most hackers and people who do uh, interesting work uh, don't have any certifications because a certification is usually like a week long course. I've been doing this stuff 42 years. Um, yeah, see, that's incorrect. And it shows that he is coming from those old days um, as well. Uh, that, that was true at a time, but it's not anymore. There are many very excellent uh, forensic certifications. And he said he does have one. He didn't mention which maybe he will in a moment. I can't recall. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he's also conflating forensic work with hackers and quote unquote people who do interesting work, um, whatever that's supposed to mean. Well, anyway, suffice to say, no, there are many good certifications that are out there. Um, the, the hacker or people who do in interesting work, uh, whatever that's supposed to mean, um, not related, not the same, not the same ballpark. Uh, not the same state, not the same sport, um, completely, completely different types of things. Uh, the certifications that we're talking about, um, that are sort of standard in the forensics field now are not week long courses where you just take a test and you get your certification. Um, some of them are very rigorous. Uh, they require, um, multiple steps, multiple vetting processes of increasing complexity. Um, and more importantly, the one that I have at least, um, required, um, successfully completing, uh, four or was it five, I believe it was five, uh, simulated investigations where I was provided evidence and I had to write my own forensic reports. And then they were adjudicated by a team, uh, by a committee of professionals. So it was by no means a pushover. Now that, that said, Mr. Neumeister was absolutely right that many cybersecurity certifications, including some of those in forensics are absolute bull. And the reason that they're bull is because they are the kinds of things where you pay $4,000, you get enrolled in a two week long course. And at the end you're given a test and then you get your certification. Those are not, in my opinion, valid certifications, but that said, not all of them are like that. And some of them are actually very, uh, reliable as far as their, um, ability to adjudicate competency. My partner, Matt Erickson, he, uh, He's actually a, a objection, Your Honor, to the 
partner is not testifying to no, qualifications right. on relevance. Sustain the objection. Yep. Mr. Newmeister, can you just describe which professional certifications you have received? Uh, for uh, cell phones, uh, Oxygen, uh, which is a, a program similar to Celebrite. Okay, so he has one certification, which is a, a certification, a product certification, as we call them. So he's certified to use Oxygen, which is a valid forensic tool uh, for mobile forensic work. It is just good. Uh, it is commonly used anyway. Uh, mobile Edit is another one. Um, this is a product certification, just as we see sometimes forensic practitioners with NCASE certifications. NCASE is a forensic suite, so sometimes you'll see those around. Uh, but these are uh, these are programs that are used by law enforcement and by private parties to extract data from cell phones um, that has been deleted or uh, which is critical in a lot of cases deleted data or just to what we call image a cell phone in other words get every bit of data that's possible on a cell phone and again every cell phone is different the next would be in a cell tower a cell tower forensics so the process of imaging that he's alluding to, there are many different types of images that you can take. Uh, typically, when we say forensic image in the industry, we're talking about a uh, physical image. Uh, so, or, so physical or bitstream or full image, sometimes are terms that are used. And what that means is that it's a bitstream copy, meaning that every bit that's on the disk, every one and every zero that's written to the disk is copied one for one over to a forensic copy. There are other types of images, though. There are logical extractions, and what that means is that it's going to not be a bitstream copy, but it will be a forensic copy of all files that are indexed by a file system, which this is getting more complicated, of course, but that's kind of part of the reason why I recorded this video so that I could expound on some of these details. Um, with cell phones, uh, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, only part of cell phones are going to be disk evidence. There's very little disk evidence on a phone. So on a standard mobile device, you will have perhaps an expansion card, right? So you, you have an SD card maybe that you put into it. That's disk evidence, and that's fine. That's not volatile evidence. You can pull it out and you can image it, uh, do a full bitstream copy. There's going to be local storage on the device that, again, is disk evidence, but that disk evidence is going to be virtualized. So when you turn a phone on, it's mostly what is known as volatile evidence. So what that means is that when the phone boots up, um, it will extract uh, data out of virtual memory, so something saved on the disk, and it will load resident processes, and it basically operates in that state until it's powered off. So there's relatively less of a digital device, a, a mobile device, rather, um, that can be uh, bitstream imaged. What you're really doing in that case is known as a, as a, a live extraction or a volatile uh, memory extraction. Um, Oxygen is one of the tools that, that will allow you to do that. Are you a member of any professional associations in your field? Yes, um, the IEEE, which is the International Engineering Society. And the reason I belong to that is about 40% of the world's white papers on electronics are published through IEEE. So they have a huge uh, database on anything from um, microwave technology to uh, telephone transmission technology. Anything that I might work with, they might have a white paper on it. Also, uh, with the Audio Engineering Society, AES, I, uh, I'm a member of that. I lecture to AES. Um, uh, uh, there's a few others, but again, they're just uh, mainly to have a repository of information. Uh, so that's a good a good answer there. I myself am also a member of IEEE for the same reason. They have all the white papers, so it's important to note. But I don't know if he actually mentions any other forensic organizations. Let's see. They have a huge uh, database on anything from um, microwave technology to uh, telephone transmission technology, anything that I might work with, they might have a white paper on it. Also, uh, with the Audio Engineering Society, AES, I, uh, I'm a member of that. I lecture to AES. Um, uh, this makes sense for for his, his um, audio forensic work, um, not so much for the reasons that he's here to testify, but they did ask. Uh, there's a few others, but again, they're just uh, mainly to have a repository of information. Have you received any honors? 
So he didn't mention any forensic societies. So uh, IEEE is a good one for the answer he gave. There's the American Association of Forensic Scientists. There's the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. There's other scientific working groups that are out there. SWIG-D is, is hardly the, the only one. Uh, there's the International Society for Computer Forensic Examiners. There are many other um, professional organizations that one can be a member if digital forensics is your thing. So um, the fact that he didn't at least mention the AAFS, the American Association of Forensic Scientists, um, is a little bit odd to me. I would think that if you've been in the in the industry that long, um, that you would want to be a member, mostly for the same reasons you would want to be a member of IEEE. So um, yeah, that's a little bit strange. Uh, I myself uh, am a member of the AAFS, of SWIG-D, of uh, the International Society of Computer Forensic Examiners. My certification is a CE, CCE, um, and uh, I'm also a member of, of more regional uh, forensic groups, um, that uh, pertain to, to my state and my, my region, my general area. Have you received any honors or awards? Yes, I've received about 80 honors and awards. I have, uh, for videography, I've got a total of 12 Emmy Award statues, but I've been the principal in 39 Emmy Awards, which means I've written the music for the uh, program, and, and the program has won the Emmy Award for music, but it was given to the production company, which happens a lot. I won for best editing. I won for best ace editing, which is um, computer editing. Uh, best sound. So again, we're conflating his work as a photographer slash videographer with his work as a forensic expert. Um, when you when the question was, have you received any awards or or accolades for your work? Um, the question was broad, so he's answering it broadly. It should have been you know for forensic work. Um, no forensic scientist is, you're not going to win an Emmy. All right. You're, you're just not, it's, it's a totally different thing. So he's won awards for his photography and videography. He hasn't been, he hasn't received any grants. He hasn't received any awards or, or any professional accommodations or anything from, from any other societies that deal specifically with forensic work. I've won, uh, I've done the music to a piece that won the gold lion at the Cannes Film Festival. I've done uh, music, to a piece that ran that won the gold at the Calgary Film Festival, I've got a, a lot of awards from Associated Press and different uh, uh, companies from doing documentaries and news. Have you published any works um, in the field of digital forensics? Yes, uh, and they're mostly articles, about a half dozen of them or so. We don't have much time, and I don't usually do it, but it was basically on most of my work deals around clarifying or authenticating. So it was basically the things I published were on clarification of digital files. Now, the fact that he's not an academic and he has journal papers published, even if it's just six, uh, is sufficient enough for me. Um, if he were an academic, if he if he were in academia, I you know I would like to I would expect to see more anyway. Um, but the number of articles that you have published doesn't necessarily diminish his ability to present this evidence as an expert. Um, the fact that he has six I, is He's being a, a little bit defensive here, saying, you know, immediately, oh, I don't have time. Um, but I, I would be proud of that answer, personally. Have you appeared on TV as an expert in digital forensics? Yes. Uh, where? Uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, BBC, um, Discovery Channel, a uh, number of different uh, things. Any uh, particular examples of things that you've spoken on TV about? Oh, Boston bombings, how the frame averaging was done on that, sort of things like that. Um, again, we get calls a lot, but I don't speak specifically about cases. I just speak about technology. Have you given any public lectures in the field of digital forensics? Yes, we get off as quite often, but due to our schedule, it's a little rough. We do what's called INSA court. We do, uh, we speak in front of private investigator groups. We do attorneys continuing legal education. Um, just uh, auto, audio engineering society, just um, we try to do a few a year and that's about what our schedules will allow given our, 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 our time. Your Honor, at this point, I'd like to tender Mr. Neumeister as an expert in the field of digital forensics. Any objection? No objection, All right, Your Honor. so moved. <clears throat> Mr. Neumeister, turning to the work you've done in this case, um, what have you done? I was asked to analyze the uh, photographs or photographs of purported injuries to Ms. Heard. Uh, this is, a, in my experience, a, a totally normal thing to, for someone uh, in his position to be asked to do. He has a small firm. Um, 
he, he appears to have competency. Uh, and so contacting someone like this in, in a case uh, such as this to say, Hey, you know, do you have the ability to do a quick turnaround on these? Uh, this is totally, totally normal for this, uh, this type of, uh, of work. And what was the purpose of that analysis? To authenticate photos or to, uh, to review and see if they were uh, altered in any way. Yeah. He kind of slipped up a little bit there. He said, uh, to authenticate photos. Um, maybe he, what he meant to say is to authenticate photos if possible, and then to analyze to see if there was any alterations to those photos would be a more concise answer. Not that I, again, not that I'm, uh, uh, picking nits here or anything like that. Um, because the images in this case, they, they cannot be authenticated. What did you analyze to, to reach your opinions? Well, I analyzed groups of photos that were submitted by uh, Ms. Hurd's legal team. What work did you do to analyze those photographs? Well, normally you start off by looking at the what's called the EXIF data. The EXIF data is the binary data that's encoded into a photograph. It tells you, for example, um, if the flash fired, if the, what the operating software version was of the cell phone for, or camera that, that shot a photo, what type of lens was used, what the f-stop was. There's literally about a thousand lines of code in the EXIF data on a JPEG photo. So we would start with an EXIF uh, editor or an EXIF viewer. Um, so yeah, um, I can actually show you uh, what he's talking about here. What he's talking about, EXIF data. EXIF stands for Extended Image Format. And his description of it as being binary code that is embedded in an image is not inaccurate, but is also just a bit of a little bit of a misnomer, I suppose. Um, so what uh, EXIF data is, Extended Image Format Data. What it is, is essentially, so every file on every computer system is going to have metadata associated with it, right? Metadata like file created, the Mac B time, right? the uh, time created, the last modified, et cetera. Uh, we'll also have other metadata like the file size in uh, such and so forth. EXIF data is an extension of that metadata that essentially tracks additional attributes of the image, which yes, does include, or could include, I should say, um, things like technical information with the capturing of the photo, which it could include, yes, f-stop information, make and model, um, that kind of good stuff. Um, but uh, doesn't necessarily include all of those things. And as metadata isn't necessarily bulletproof, either because you can edit metadata. Uh, I'm going to uh, use a tool here, if you don't mind, called Forensically. Now this is not, oh, can I spell it? Oh, there it is. Um, so this is not necessarily a tool that I would consider to be um, a forensic tool necessarily. Um, I mean, it does do you can do forensic uh, testing with it, examination, I should say. Um, but, um, you know, I would normally, for EXIF data, I would use a specialized tool, an EXIF viewer, um, and I would normally use special dedicated tools for, for other things as well. But this will suit our, our purposes just fine. Um, so when we go to uh, forensically here, we take a look at it. I'm going to pick a picture. Here we go. There's a picture of my daughter from a couple of years ago. Right. So we have visual data that we're looking at right now. My daughter in front of a fountain, we've got cars in the background, we've got a building, we've got a sky, we've got, a, you know, all this, this stuff. Now, of course, an image is going to contain data um, other than the visual image data. Lots of it, as a matter of fact, and there's a number of tests that we can do. But if we come down here uh, to uh, metadata, uh, we can see that here is some of the attributes that are attached to that image. You can see that this image width and height here in pixels Make of the camera, Samsung model, SMG 930R4. These are captured when the image is created. If I search for that, you can see Galaxy S7 comes up here on the Samsung website. So we got a make and model of the camera. Orientation is going to be, you know, whether or not it is upright or on the side. Sometimes images will be rotated automatically. 
Uh, X and Y resolution, resolution unit software version. This is going to come up in just a moment here. Um, modified date, GPS version and geotagging information. Here's some of our uh, technical information when it comes to the actual capturing of the image. Exposure time, F number, ISO, max aperture value, light source, whether the flash was used, uh, and so on. So lots of technical information. But again, this is not binary code embedded into the image. This is metadata. It's just extended image format metadata. It's just metadata with additional attributes that have been added. So uh, again, he's not wrong. I'm not arguing at all. I believe that, that is maybe one way that it could be interpreted, uh, but I do think it's a little bit of a misrepresentation. here. Anything else that you looked at? Yes, um, when we're dealing with RGB cameras, which are red, green, and blue channel cameras, which would be a cell phone or a, a basic home camera, they're based on RGB channels. We would do um, four, type, four types of scopes. We would do a vector scope, we do, we do a luminance scope, we do a waveform scope, and then what's called an RGB parade. And those scopes analyze different things. The vector scope analyzes where the different types of colors are headed in, for example, it's broken up into reds, magenta, and different areas on a, on a scope. We would, um, we would take a look at that to see if there's anything out of the normal for the type of camera being used. In other words, would there be above a certain percentage of chroma. And chroma means color saturation. Objection, Your Honor. Um, outside the scope, we, we can approach. All right, like. you want to approach? Um, so he's, he's correct about that. Um, what he's talking about is, is using different methods to visually observe image data. So um, for example, over here on Forensically, if I go back to the, um, the magnifier here, um, we can we can do some enhancements here. We can um, you know uh, we have a histogram equalization. Notice that when we zoom in, the color is different because it's just doing an equalization of that particular area of the image. Um, but we can do um, other steps here as well. Uh, what he's talking about with a uh, vector graph um, is, or sorry, a vector scope um, is something like this, where we can, we can see the visual representation of, cause when we're examining an image, we tend to get lost in the image itself. We, we look at what it's representing. We can look at the data of an image with vector scopes and, um, RGB parades and so on. Um, so here we have an image, whatever image this originally happened to be, this is just representing the visual data in another medium along another plane so that we can see what is going on with the image without getting confused uh, by the image itself. So uh, with the vector scope here, we can see the RGB values are separated. Uh, this would be looking at them uh, separately, so laid out next to each other. This would be a representation of the same view, but now on the side, right? So we can see how color mixing occurs. Okay, the attorneys have been called to approach to the bench. Uh, there has been an objection about whether or not this is within the scope of the testimony that was meant to be offered. Um, so yes, uh, uh, chrominance, luminance, they are important factors to, to digital images. And you can use a vector scope uh, in this fashion um, to determine um, if the reported uh, information is indeed the same um, as, uh, as what is being reported on the XF data. So for example, if we had a, a vector scope here, um, that showed, um, for example, if we go to the metadata, we had a make and model, uh, and it says that it was taken with, uh, maybe some other, uh, type of camera. We, we may be able to determine that as well. Uh, but there are other ways as well. So for example, um, Oh, and I should mention, EXIF data is not present on all digital images. There are only certain image formats that subscribe to EXIF data. So uh, um, JPEGs and PNGs are two extremely common um, uh, file types for digital images. Um, they and TIFFs, um, but those are the only ones, um, at least that are in common use that I'm aware of. Um, so other image types don't have EXIF data. Um, certain video types will have EXIF data. Um, not every image format is lossy, right? So 
there are certain tests that we can do for lossy formats that we can't do for lossless formats. Um, anyway, uh, as I was mentioning, this is a JPEG. So uh, another thing that we can do here is JPEG analysis, and that will give us uh, access to the quantization tables. This is going to come up in a moment, uh, but the quantization tables also describe luminance and chrominance. So we will come back to that uh, when it is time. Mr. Neumeister, based on the um, analysis you performed in this case, uh, have you formed any opinions? Pardon? Based on the analysis you've done in this case, have you formed any opinions? Yes. What are they? Well, three basic ones. One is quite a number of the photos have been through a photo, uh, at least one, possibly two. Objection, Your Honor, foundation, which photos is he referring to? We have to go through this one by one. Okay. One's in evidence. Uh, Mr. Neumeister. In terms of the photos um, that you looked at and that you formed opinions about, do you do you understand if they've been submitted as evidence in this case? Yes. Okay. And what conclusions have you formed about those? Same objection, Your Honor. That doesn't cure the issue of the objection. We have to go through this. Which photos is she talking about? Which ones in evidence? What exhibit numbers? That's that's the basis of the we're objection. We're talking generally about opinions right now, Your Honor, and we're going to get into some specifics. I think we have to go straight to the specifics. Okay. So what's happening there is um, the uh, DEP council, the ones who have retained uh, Mr. Neumeister here, they would like to talk about all of the images as a group. It's to their advantage to do that because talking about all of them as a group uh, allows them to insinuate that all of the images are potentially altered. The uh, herd side is objecting to that. They want to go through through them one at a time. Uh, the advantage of that is number one, it wastes more of the deputy attorney's time. Um, number two, it gives them more to argue against later on. And number three, it means that they can say, well, one out of 50 images may have been edited. So it makes for their argument to, uh, to be a bit stronger. Um, Mr. Neumeister, have you prepared a demonstrative um, that aids in your testimony with respect to any of the photos that you looked at in this case? Yes. Um, I'd like to pull up plaintiff's 1303, Your Honor, if I might approach. All right. Your Honor, I would, again, object. We can approach to discuss okay, it. Okay, approach. Tom, can we pull up um, Defendant's Exhibit 170A, which has been admitted into evidence? Mr. Neumeister, um, is this, does this photo appear to be one that you have analyzed as part of your analysis in this case? There were many versions of this photo. Um, I would say there were dozens of different versions with different chromatic values, different file sizes, different physical sizes. Some had been through Photos 1 or Photos three, which are photo editing software uh, programs. Okay. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to um, show Mr. Demo Mr. Neumeister's demonstrative um, plaintiff's exhibit 1303. All right. Any other objection? I would object again, Your Honor, because the photograph in 170A is not in evidence. Right. Or, yeah, I mean, the photograph is in evidence. The None of the photographs he wishes to show the jury are in evidence. 1303 is in evidence over objection. Oh, not in evidence, I'm sorry, as a demonstrative. Just as a demonstrative. I'm sorry. Could we go to the publishing this very please? So. And Mr. Neumeister, um, what does this demonstrative show about um, the photos that you analyzed? Well, they, they appear to be similar, however. So I, a demonstrative, by the way, is something that an expert will put together in order to better explain their findings after conducting they're, after they've been engaged, they conduct an investigation based upon evidence that will or may not be presented at trial. So they will essentially provide information as the attorneys will provide information to the expert. They will analyze it. They will produce a report. A demonstrative is when the expert brings in something to help explain their results um, to, to show visually to the, this is part of, uh, of explaining uh, scientific and technical processes and techniques to jurors who are, you know, lay people. Uh, a demonstrative is critical for that. However, if you look below at the file sizes, uh, one on the left is 712 kilobytes. The one in the middle is 489 kilobytes. 
and the one on the right is 524 kilobytes. Now what's unusual about that is these photos will not digitally fingerprint with each other. They won't hash. In other words, forensically, they don't match. So this is uh, getting into some of the, the splitting hairs as we do here uh, when providing testimony. Um, what, he's make, what he's talking about here is a distinction between photographs that are visually identical and photographs that are forensically identical. So the photographs that we see here are visually identical. They're not forensically identical. They're visually identical because they seem to be the same picture. They look the same. And we're doing this on face value, right? There may be subtle differences that we're not seeing with our eyes right away. We would have to conduct a full examination for that. But forensically, they are definitely not identical because they have different file sizes and they won't hash properly. A hash value is essentially when you take data of any type, it doesn't have to be an image, it could be text, it could be a video, it could be anything. And we put that through a hashing algorithm. Hashing algorithms are deterministic, meaning that a small change, a single bit that flips from a one to a zero will result in a dramatically different outcome. Um, that outcome will be a hash value, which is a, uh, a representation of that data in a certain number of characters, depending on the hashing algorithm, that we can use as a digital fingerprint for that piece of data. The fact that they are different file sizes, that's an indicator that they're not the same. The fact that they won't hash is a 100% certainty that they are not the same. Something is different with each of them. The file size is probably a clue as to what that thing is, but we don't know for sure. We just know that they're different. The fact that they're different sizes tells us that they're different compression levels. Most likely these are JPEGs. That is a lossy format. And every time you save a JPEG, a little bit of information is lost. A little bit of information is lost and the file size gets smaller and smaller. But some of the visual data is lost along with it. Now, I don't have these images in front of me, although I may be able to find them. Um, uh, but that does tell us something. But the thing is, you could say, well, it was sent through email, maybe it's a different size. This, the file sizes, for example, would be possibly, uh, you know, you can select the file size, you send a photo, but there's no way to authenticate any photo that was presented in the way the evidence was collected. So he's right. Um, you cannot authenticate this evidence. It was not collected. Uh, as far as I understand, it was not collected in a way that m maintains its forensic integrity uh, whatsoever. And so what conclusions do you draw from that? Well, there's, this is just three of many of the same type of photos that are all different sizes and have different chromatic, which means color. Objection, Your Honor. We just had a ruling on this. All right. Sustain objection. Mr. Inuester, stick to your opinions that relate specifically to what you analyzed about the EXIF data, please. All three of these photos had to go through some type of transformation to change sizes. We can take that one down. Um, you mentioned um, uh, photos 1.5 and photos 3.0 earlier, I believe. Photos. What, what uh, is that? Photos 3 and photos 1.5 are editing programs that um, Macintosh or Apple put out with their product. It's for uh, editing photos. In other words, you would put a photo in and you would change the colors or you would crop it or you would clarify it by you know, enhancing, for example, the sharpening or you could darken it. Um, but when you save a photo through an editing program, you leave a mark on the EXIF data. And what is the EXIF data? The EXIF data is the data that is embedded in a photograph that tells you a lot about the photograph. And again, in the early days when we were using film cameras, you would write down the... Um, so, yeah, um, again, uh, that is that is true. So the uh, EXIF data does indeed contain information, um, you know, about um, the make and model of the camera, but also the software version. Um, so the software version here tells us um, that this is Samsung S7, uh, but it was this version. So um, this G93R4, this is Android 7 Nougat. Um, now, if I take that same image, let's go back up here to uh, be visually identical. Uh, I'm going to make a copy of this so I don't alter the original. 
And I'm going to open up GIMP. So you can see exactly what I'm doing. GIMP is an open source uh, photo editing program. If you're not familiar with it, it's sort of an open source version of uh, Photoshop, I guess would be the, the best direct analog. All right. And uh, if actually we go down here and we look at JPEG analysis, uh, we can see here's these quantization tables, right? And these quantization tables would be commiserate with a Samsung S7 because that is what was used to take the picture. If I go to GIMP and I grab our photo and I just drop it in there, it gets imported here into GIMP. And now I'm not going to make any alterations. I'm just going to file and uh, actually let's export it. If I save it, it'll try and save it as a proprietary um, format. Um, this will be, I'll just change it to, actually, let's not change. Let's not change the file name. Let's leave that exactly the same. Just going to export it and we'll overwrite it. All right, we're leaving check save XF data. All right, now I'll come back here to Forensically and let's open it up over here. Then I grab that image and I drop it in here. We can see side by side, they are visually identical. If we take a look, however, if we go to metadata here, what do we see? That software version has changed. In addition to that, we actually have some other changes here as well. Our uh, image width and height are no longer part of that XF data. Our other metadata, like the modified date and so on, has also changed. Some of the XF data remains because we asked it to preserve it when we did the export. Um, oh, here we have XF image width and XF image height, but we don't have the image width and height here. So that was recorded in two separate places. So some of it was preserved because we asked asked it to preserve it, but it did leave a, a, a change. It was changed. It changed the software. There are things that are different about them, even though they are visually identical. No alterations were made. This is not an image forgery, but it did change that information. Uh, we can also take a look at something else that's interesting here. So quantization tables uh, are applied not just by cameras when a picture is taken. They're applied by image editing software when they're imported as well. So when I opened that up in GIMP, it did change the picture. It changed the quantization tables. So as we can see, they're different. This is our original. This is the quote unquote, altered image, the one that was opened up in the editing image editing software. So that doesn't necessarily mean that there was any modifications. It's not an image forgery. This is where we're getting into sort of a splitting of, of hairs here of, of terminology. So um, when we're talking about an image alteration, image alteration means that we have an image and it has been altered in some fashion. Sometimes those alterations are not an attempt to deceive the viewer. Uh, it might be simply done uh, in order to make the photo more aesthetically pleasing, right? News stories alter images all the time. They change the sharpness and the contrast. They make it look better. Every advertisement we ever see is an altered image. Then we have image forgeries, which are created with an attempt to deceive. Um, Sometimes those alterations are done with basic image enhancements, the same way that we would do just basic alterations. Um, sometimes they might be composites and a composite is when you take two images or elements of multiple images and you put them all together to make it seem as if, you know, for example, my daughter wasn't really standing in front of this fountain, uh, although she was in this case. Um, so just because an image is opened in an image editing program doesn't mean that it was altered and it doesn't mean that it's a forgery just because an image is altered doesn't mean that it's a forgery and so on. We're really getting into splitting hairs here, but it's not a matter of technical differences. It's a matter of definitions. Technically speaking, these images are not the same image. Technically speaking, they are not 100% are not forensically identical. They are visually identical on the f-stop which is the, the light setting you would you would write the type of lens you use the time of day 
um, the type of film stock, the type of filters you're using. Now with digital cameras, uh, that's done electronically, and there's about about a thousand lines of code, of which 50 are probably important, that tell you what the camera was doing. So what's the significance of EXIF data in your photo analysis? Well, in this situation, I can see that normally where the operating system of the camera would be, which means the version that the of operating system the phone is running on, it would normally say something like, I'll just throw out an arbitrary number, 9.1.3 operating system for iOS, which is Apple's iPhone operating system. Instead of saying that, it says software photos 3.0 or photos 1.0. That means that the photo had to be rendered, which means composited together in an editing program. That is, that is true. As we just saw with GIMP, when an image is imported into GIMP, that's when the change is made. Now on iOS, Photos is able to edit images, but just like with most image processors on a camera, you can also make alterations um, and so on, right? So it's an image editing software, but it can also be used for cropping and, and, and filters and stuff like that as well, which, which are image alterations, by the way. I'm not splitting hairs here. Those are image alterations. But the mere act of opening an image and saving it in that is enough to make that change. So the EXIF data is only an indicator of what's going on with an image. It's not the end all be all. It's just an attribute. Did you prepare a demonstrative that shows uh, some of your analysis of some of the EXIF data of the photos in this case? Yes, I did. Okay, can we pull up 1304, please? Your Honor, may I approach? You okay? Permission to publish as a demonstrative, Your Honor. Any any objection? Any objection, Mr. I'm sorry, Murphy? Your Honor. She was just to publish so it sorry. as a demonstrative. Um. Uh, no objections, demonstrative. All right, thank you. We'll publish it as 1304, just as a demonstrative. And Mr. Newmeister, are, are these I images in this demonstrative excerpts from the report you prepared in this case? Yes, they are. And what do they show? On this particular uh, photo, and, and on all of them, it shows the first few lines of EXIF data, the ones that would be most important for this photograph. So, for example, things you would see, the very top line would be the make of a uh, phone. It's an Apple iPhone 6. And then the resolution is 72 pixels per inch, 72 to 1. Um, and instead, where it says software on a normal iPhone photo, it would, instead of saying Photos 3, it would say uh, the software version, for example, 9.3.1. And then you've got the date and the time of the photo uh, below that, and which is really easy to change in an EXIF editor. And below that, you have uh, things like the, exact, uh, like the flash, you've got, um, the exposure type, how long the exposure was. Uh, so what you just highlighted there again was the date and time. Uh, so that's uh, universal time code minus whatever area you're in uh, in the world. Anything else you want to show us with this demonstrative? Uh, yeah, just below that, if you look up, there's some um, things that would say, uh, for example, a directly photographed image. That is not going to be necessarily accurate once it's been through an editor. Uh, it will always pretty much say that. Um, so when you're looking at scene, scene type or auto exposure, um, these are things that, uh, that really don't matter all that much. What would matter is, um, for example, if you're taking notes, the focal length would be important, um, the pattern of metering, things like that to a photographer would be, would be important. And again, this is just a few lines, and the reason I put these in there was just to explain a bit what EXIF data is. Uh, the actual thing I'm trying to point out is the fact that instead of an operating system, it shows the, um, uh, the editing program that was used on this photo. 
Um, are there additional photos that you did this analysis for? Yes, many. Okay. Um, can we scroll to the next page, please, Tom? Is there anything um, about this photo that you noted as part of your analysis, Mr. Neumeister? Yes, again, it's, it's uh, you know, right, right there you've got photos 3.0 on that particular photo. And I think, you know, we pretty much covered what the, what the stuff is. But again, you see the photos 3.0. And again, this could not come out of an iPhone this way. This would go into a computer, be edited, and rendered through the photo uh, editing, photo editor. And this would then be embedded in the um, EXIF data. Okay. Do you have other photos in this demonstrative? Yes. All right, can we scroll to the next page? Uh, same thing. You've got up here in the top, you've got the, uh, the photos 3.0. And this is uh, throughout a lot of the photos that are uh, in evidence or versions of the photos in evidence were gone through photos 3.0 or photos 1.5, an earlier version. So the, the question is, is uh, on iOS, when you take a picture with the camera, does it automatically process it with photos? Um, and the answer is it does not. So when you take a picture on an iOS camera, or I'm sorry, when you take a picture on an iPhone, um, then it will take and store uh, that photo as is in the gallery, um, and it will have in the EXIF data the iPhone and the OS number that he's referring to. Only if it is opened up in photos will it then change the EXIF data to apply that tag. But as we just saw with GIMP, just because it's opened and saved in an image editing program doesn't mean it was altered. Can we scroll to the next um, page, please, Tom? And what about this one? Same thing, Photos 3.0. And again, in a photo uh, editing app, you can do an awful lot of things. So when you see Photos 3.0, first of all, you know it's not anywhere near an original. There's gonna be compression artifacts because it's a JPEG file. What, what he's asking, what he's saying here is when, when we're doing um, image analysis, we want the best evidence to examine that we possibly can. What we really, really want is what's known as camera original, meaning that it is the version of the picture exactly as it appeared when it was first created by the camera. Now this, if we had two, let's say we have two images here in front of us and we wanted to know which of these is camera original. Well, one of the things we would look at is this. If I see that it was opened and saved in GIMP, I know this isn't camera original. Right. I don't know what happened in GIMP. I would have to do an analysis, and even then I may not be able to tell exactly what was done with it. But I know for sure it's not camera original. But this one, even though the metadata doesn't show that, it, I mean, it shows that it's got the uh, software uh, information, all of this is correct, this doesn't necessarily mean that this image is camera original either. And as a matter of fact, we can tell that it's not. Because again, if we look at the quantization tables, we can see that the quantization tables is part of the process in lossy image formats that leads to compression, which is a more complicated process than I'll get into here. But suffice to say, the quantization tables provide figures that go into the process of compression when a lossy format image is saved, like a JPEG. And we can approximate the quality of the JB, the image that we're looking at provided we can match these quantization tables. We can see uh, that this is only about 92%, 92% the original image data as it appeared when it came off of the camera. Let me see if I can find a, another image here to help. Uh, I'm going to open up forensically again, and I'm going to get a different image this time. Let's do, um, if I drop another image over here, this time it's my daughter showing off her alien that she just drew, and we check out the quantization tables for this, we can see that this is of a much higher quality. And if we look back at the first image we were looking at, which again, visually identical, this is our, uh, this is what we originally worked with. And this is the one we saved in GIMP. If we look at the one we saved in GIMP, we'll note that it has a slightly higher quality than the one that is closer to camera original in terms of its provenance. Why is that? Well, because the image that came off the camera, this is not camera original because it's been compressed. 
but it is its provenance. So the origin of the image is closer to camera original. This is of better quality because this is a copy of the image that we imported into GIMP. So it, this is important to keep in mind. We're talking about image quality, but this image of my daughter and the alien is close to camera original 96% and 92% as in our original image that we were looking at is certainly nothing to sneeze at. We would still consider that to be a high quality image, all things considered. Now, what happens to an image when it gets compressed in JPEGs for lossy images is it develops JPEG artifacts, what we call errors in the image. Uh, so we can see you know, uh, around here, the finer details and stuff, we can see these blocks that appear. Uh, if we do error level analysis here and forensically, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is the one we edited in GIMP. This is the image uh, that is closer to camera original. We can see the error levels are very similar. So when you get to, when you get to this level where it's near 95, 99%, um, it's, uh, there's not a lot of errors that are in it, but we can see that there is a different error pattern here. So the compression artifacts he's referring to are what we were just discussing here when we were doing error level analysis on our photo. Uh, those are JPEG artifacts, um, also known as errors. Let me uh, get GIMP here again. And uh, we'll take the same photo again. And we will compress it. And then we'll compare error levels here. Let's go back to our plain view. Okay, and then we're gonna do the same thing uh, as we did before, right? Here is our, uh, in terms of provenance, our closest to camera original image. Okay, and we will now uh, go ahead, once again, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do another copy here. So we will export and we'll call this one compressed and we'll bump the quality down. Let's say, let's do, how about 70%, 72% here. And we'll bring that into forensically. We're going to drop that here since we're not using this image anymore. Okay. Now we have three images here side by side, and all of them are visually identical. None of them are forensically identical. So if we do error level analysis on our camera original image, there's that. Uh, here is the error level analysis once again on the image that we brought into GIMP and then exported using high compression settings. We see that the error levels are not exactly the same but they are comparable. And if we take this one, which was compressed to about 70%, now we have a significant difference in error levels appearing, right? If we go side by side, camera original, 70% compression. So while they're still visually identical, the compression does lead to a degradation in time. So what is happening here? JPEGs are what are known as a lossy format. And what that means is every time they're saved, they undergo a process of compression. And what that compression means, essentially in a nutshell in lay terms, is that every time it is saved, um, what is happening is the compression algorithm is running and is essentially truncating a certain amount of information from the image. It's essentially simplifying it. So what was normally um, a group, and this is done in JPEGs in 8 by 8 eight by eight pixel matrices. Uh, uh, what is happening is each of those individual pixels are calculated in terms of luminance and chrominance, and then they are rounded down in order to simplify them. And what that means is the file size, every time it's compressed, gets smaller and smaller. It means a small amount of visual information uh, is lost, it gets smaller and smaller, um, to the point where eventually it becomes visible in the visual data of the image that some compression has occurred. So if we do, again, a side-by-side, -side, the error pattern here is fairly uniform and unique. We even have, uh, even with just about 8% of the original image data lost, 
uh, we, we can see that there are blocks here, which is why JPEG artifacts appear to be squares, uh, is because when JPEG compression occurs, it's in eight by eight pixel blocks. So we get these chunks that sort of start to appear in certain areas where the visual image data has simply, it's been simplified, right? Uh, it's just more apparent the more compression that occurs. So let's take uh, that image again, and we're gonna export it again. And we'll use the same file name, we'll just overwrite. And this time, instead of 70%, let's go, let's go down to about around 30%. There we go, 28% should do us just fine. And we're gonna go back to the visual representation here so we can see what's going on. Export is complete. And now I'm going to drop this once again into Forensic Leap. Now you may not have been able to, to see uh, on the screen recording here what happened, but there was a visual difference here. Now, if we go side by side, might be able to see it. Again, this is a screen recording, so you may not be able to see it, but I can see with my naked eye here, if I switch between camera original to compressed, it's visual. I can see that there are JPEG artifacts here on this image. If we do the error level analysis, here's our camera original, and here is much higher compression levels. Now that is a stark contrast. So that is one way we can tell whether or not an image is original. If it, if it has been compressed, then we know that it's at least been saved a number of times. But that's not necessarily a bulletproof answer because this is what is essentially camera original, but it too has been compressed uh, simply because this is an image that has been floating around for quite a while and I retrieved it from cloud storage. And he does talk about cloud storage later. Um, when an image, even if it appears to be camera original, has been uploaded to the, the cloud or has been transferred in any way, it undergoes changes as well. So camera original means that it comes directly off the camera as it was captured. Neither of them are camera original, but in terms of provenance, we can say that this image is definitely closer to camera original than this one. Right. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Can we move on um, to the next page of this um, demonstrative, please? And again, same thing. Uh, you've got the photos app. Okay. And I believe there's one final photo in this um, demonstrative. What about this one? Again, if you look up there, it says uh, photos 3.0 on that particular photo. All right, we can take that one down. Um, Your Honor, I have a little bit left. I don't know if you wanted to. All right, you want to take our afternoon. Let's go ahead and take our afternoon recess. Just uh, do not discuss the case and don't do any outside research. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Neumeister, do you have another demonstrative prepared um, that shows a photo with EXIF data reflecting that it was saved in Photos 3? Correct. Uh, photos 3, yes. Um, Your Honor, we have a video of um, these photos, and we're happy to play it once um, so that counsel can review, if that's all right. Okay. All right, we took care of that, Your Honor. Right, thank you. Uh, may we publish, or would you like to see it? I'd just like to see it first. Yeah. Okay. And what's, what's demonstrative is this going to be then? This is plaintiff's 1305, Your Honor. All right, thank you. So what, the, uh, what they're deliberating over now is, uh, they keep saying the word demonstrative. If you're not familiar with what that is, essentially part of an expert witness's uh, job uh, is to not only digest the information that's provided by the attorneys and provide a professional opinion in the form of a report, but they may also be asked to create certain things to help explain their results to a layperson. It's uh, part of the job of an expert witness to effectively communicate technical or scientific topics to people who are unfamiliar with the subject matter. And so a demonstrative is essentially um, some way of conveying that information and it can take any form. Um, generally speaking, it's going to be some visual format, uh, for example, with, uh, with traffic uh, uh, crime scene reconstruction, maybe a chart that, uh, or I should say a picture uh, that lays out the roadways in question and maybe some, some movable whether they be digital 
uh, or physical paper uh, representations of the, the parties um, uh, in the matter uh, that can be moved around to show at different points in time where each vehicle was. And that just helps the jury to conceptualize the information that is otherwise perhaps merely photographic, uh, photogrammetric uh, evidence, photogrammatical evidence, excuse me. <clears throat> photogrammatical evidence um, or, uh, you know, otherwise might be difficult to visualize for certain people. So the demonstrative that he's about to show is in some way going to explain how he came to those conclusions uh, or I should say the conclusions that he came to uh, in his analysis of these images. Okay, so what this demonstrative is doing is it's looping two images being overlaid on top of each other uh, back and forth. Now they're overlaid on top of each other and when you do that there's different ways that you can do that this is not an uncommon tactic in uh, forensic image analysis uh, this is part of what we consider to be what is known as basic image enhancements and what that means is that we we can use photo editors like gimp or photoshop uh, in order to do things to images to uh, compare them or to reveal information in them or what have you it's a little bit more complicated of a topic than, uh, than that description lets on. Uh, but what that means is essentially what you've been seeing people do on other YouTube videos and other places in the news where they have taken the exhibits from the court and they have put them into a photo editor and maybe they have two layers and one of them will be overlaid with an opacity layer showing you know, that the two images are essentially identical. Uh, in this case, we don't have any opacity. They're, they're both 100% opaque and it's just flipping back and forth between them, which is in my opinion, a more effective way of demonstrating that um, when you have an opacity layer, it just, uh, and what I'm thinking of specifically here is Runkel in the Bailey, uh, who is a Canadian lawyer who has been part of several, um, what are known as law tube videos on the trial. Um, he, he did a video uh, comparing not this image here specifically, but a few more uh, that were brought up in question in the trial. Um, and what he did is he had an opacity layer to show, you know, that uh, both video, uh, both images, excuse me, were essentially identical, um, which is uh, not an ineffective route to take. And I certainly don't take any exception with that approach. Uh, but as a forensic examiner, we would want to avoid that whenever we can. Sometimes we do need to make enhancements to a video, such as brightness and contrast and so on, in order to reveal information. Uh, but generally speaking, what we want to do as forensic examiners is number one, examine the absolute best evidence we can, which means camera original or um, or with the provenance of such images can be distinctly uh, provided and to alter them in as little uh, as few ways as possible to arrive at our conclusions. So adding an opacity layer is simply um, one layer of complexity that we would prefer to eliminate whenever possible. And having both lay both images overlaid on top of each other and flipping back and forth like this is a uh, is a more effective, more sound practice as far as as the image comparison goes. You can also see in the lower right hand corner here we have uh, Mr. Neumeister has added uh, the EXIF data, as far as the software version that was attached to these images. Now, one thing about EXIF data is it's just metadata. They're just extended image format attributes, and they can be edited. Uh, they can absolutely very easily be edited. Uh, they're, they're by no means hard-coded into an image, and changing EXIF data does not at all change the visual representation of the image. Um, so again, it's possible that they, they, that alteration here occurs when I'm doing my examinations, EXIF data is merely one indicator. Uh, I would definitely seek to corroborate those whenever possible. Now, what we're also seeing here as we flip back and forth is that the two images are visually distinct. Um, but what changes precisely are we looking at? So let's, let's play it and we'll go back and forth. What we're looking at here now uh, is an image that says iOS 9.3.1. So that would be the EXIF data with the software version for just a raw iOS image. And when it flips over, there we have the next image. It says Photos 3. And we can see that it is visually distinct. It's not the same image. It has been altered in some fashion. Um, but when an image is imported into a photo editor, even if no um, no changes occur, Again, those quantization tables do change, um, and certain things 
can be done automatically. So for example, when you bring an image into Photoshop, there's going to be certain alterations that are done to it just automatically by importing that image. Uh, the quantization tables will be applied. Maybe there will be some sharpening or, or contrast balance, uh, white balancing, color balancing that may occur automatically um, without the, the user's uh, intervention in those cases. It really depends on a lot of different factors, uh, primarily what photo editing software is being done. Now, Photos 3 is a mobile platform. I also see uh, that it is available on OS X as of, I believe it was uh, OS X 9 or 10. Um, it is highly likely that it is making these alterations. Mobile applications tend to do this more than desktop applications because mobile applications are not usually intended for graphic artists um, or anyone else for that matter. It, they're, they're not generally tools for casual users. So they tend to be more static in the way that they handle images, trusting the end user to be competent and trained enough to use the program to do their own balancing. Mobile applications are meant to be available and accessible to the, the broad audience of mobile users, so lay people. And so it is more likely to do adjustments automatically because there's no assumption of competency by the user, right? Anybody can use a mobile application to edit a photo or add a filter or something like that. Now that doesn't, that also does not preclude someone from intentionally altering a photo in that application. But I'm just saying that what we're seeing here, if we contrast the two photos is it looks like there's been some color balancing. It looks like there's been some contrast balancing and so on, uh, that nothing in here, uh, suggests to me that it is a blatant attempt to alter this photo. But again, this is not my professional opinion. I did not analyze these photos. I'm really commenting on what I'm seeing here in the broadcast for the trial. And there are a lot of factors here that may alter my perception. You have to keep that in mind as well. Um, number one, I am looking at a screencast in VLC media player <clears throat> um, from a courtroom in Virginia um, through a live stream from WGN news on my monitor, right? So my monitor may, color balance may, may alter my perception. The, any changes done by WGN that I'm not aware of make may make changes. Any alterations or settings in VLC media player may alter my perception. Um, <laughs> There's just so many places here uh, where I, it would be absolutely inappropriate for me to offer a professional opinion. And I'm, so I'm not doing that here. There's, there's too many variables that I cannot control in this case, I'm merely commenting on what we may be seeing. Could you play it? Thank you. All right, so 13 marked as uh, plaintiff 1305 and used as demonstrative, you can publish to the jury. Mr. Neumeister, we're going to um, go ahead and play the demonstrative that you prepared, and then um, after the jury's had a chance to see it, if you want to explain to them um, what the demonstrative shows, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Newmeister, what was uh, depicted in that video? The same photo treated uh, two different ways. One was marked with the original op or with the operating system from an iPhone, which is iOS 9.3.1 on that particular uh, photo. The one this is 9.3.1. There is a graphic below indicating it. The second photo uh, is marked Photos 3, and it looks quite a bit different. And um, just, Tom, could we pull up Defendant 708? Mr. Neumeister, does the image in Defendant 708 appear to be uh, similar, the same photo as uh, what was depicted in your demonstrative? It's the, it, it's the actually, it's the Photos 3.0 uh, edit version. Thank you. We can take that one down, Tom. Um, Mr. Neumeister, have you also formed an opinion about Defendant's Exhibits 712 and 713? Correct. Um, did you prepare a demonstrative that shows? Um, I can show you if you'd like, Your Honor. Okay. 
And we have another sidebar here. And while that's going on, So there's a couple of things in Mr. Neumeister's testimony here that uh, that I don't see and may have been in his uh, final report, um, ultimately. I, I don't know. Um, but um, these are the two images that were shown by uh, during um, Amber Heard's cross-examination, I believe it was, um, when she originally took the stand. Um, and this is another example um, of an obviously edited photo. And this is exactly the photo that I believe Runkle and the Bailey did their comparison on. Um, so just uh, briefly, um, a couple things that, that well, I, I suppose, uh, ultimately, how would we approach uh, an examination of two images like this? Um, well, there's several steps that we would take. And it really depends on a number of different factors, primarily the provenance of the image. So the steps that we take when we're conducting an iconography, icon the steps that we take when we're conducting an iconographical uh, analysis of an image um, begins with a couple of steps. There are some advanced techniques that we can do, such as error level analysis, noise analysis, principal component analysis, and other data analytic techniques that we can use to analyze the photo. Typically, those are done when we're doing image forgery detection. Um, there are basic image enhancements that I uh, offered before. Uh, that would be where we make alterations to a copy of the evidence in order to reveal certain information. Typically, we would do this um, when an image, as Mr. Neumeister mentioned before, um, maybe was taken in a low light environment or uh, maybe has had alterations done to it to obfuscate the identity of certain subjects. An example of this would be Operation Vico. Uh, where Christopher Paul Neal, uh, who was at the time known as Swirly Face, made an attempt to obfuscate his identity in contraband pornography by using the swirl tool in Photoshop around his face. And forensic examiners had to grab those images, import them into Photoshop, and then reverse that swirl in order to reveal his face and discover his identity. That'd be an example of a basic image enhancement that we may have to do. And of course, we would do that again only in certain situations where it was warranted. Um, we would uh, also do, uh, again, various different scientific tests using, as um, Mr. Neumeister mentioned before, um, RGB parade, uh, vector scopes, and so on. Uh, in order to conduct um, some form of observation using scientific instruments in that fashion. Uh, and ultimately, what we also rely on is rank observation analysis, which is what we do with our eyes. So that's the easiest place to begin. That's generally where I begin. And so if we begin there, if we look at both of these images, number one, they are very visually similar. The distinct difference that I'm seeing here is essentially with the uh, saturation of the images. Uh, on the left-hand side is what I would presume, without knowing anything else about these images, to be camera original or closer to it in terms of its prominence. And on the right would be one that would be edited in some fashion. When I say that they are a very, a, a visually apparently similar, the subject in both scenes, Miss Amber Heard here in this case, is in the exact same pose. Um, with the exact same positioning of the hairs. And if we look at the specular highlights, they are also in the similar position. And this is, again, not unusual. This is perfectly explainable. If we were to say, well, you know, this was the camera original on the left and on the right hand side, it was brought into photos three, uh, wherein the EXIF data was changed and certain image alterations occurred automatically. That's possible. I'm not saying that that is what happened in this case, but that may be a possible explanation for that. However, I do recall during Ms. Hurd's testimony, she did attest to these being two distinctly different images. She said specifically, the one on the left was taken first, the one on the right was taken after the vanity lights came on, um, or she turned on the vanity lights on her mirror. And that uh, part, that explanation, I find to be extremely implausible. Um, she would need to be in the precise exact position. The camera would be need to be in the exact same precise position in both cases. And um, it's simply not, not possible at all. Uh, th in this case, what we would do is we would do various different scientific measurements here of the image in order to ascertain how similar these positions are. So, you know, we would do measurements, you know, across the image in order to to determine the exact position 
uh, of certain things. And we would also check to see color saturation as Mr. Neumeister did using vector scopes and so on uh, to see the apparent similarity of colors. So for example, if the uh, the color profile of the picture on the left is identical to the position on the right, except for the addition of more of a red color to that, then we can see that that would be uh, essentially a change in saturation around, along that red channel. <clears throat> Now, the other thing that we notice here, again, as I said, uh, the specular highlights are the same. Now, what's a specular highlight? Well, when, a, uh, when we uh, perceive things with our eyes, um, when light is obviously necessary in order for us to be able to perceive these things, uh, light will strike an object, it will bounce off that object, and will those, uh, those bounced rays will uh, hit our eyes, and our eyes will perceive them as color and shape and, and so on. Um, and what that leads to is uh, we are innately distinctly uh, able to determine or discern the direction of light sources simply because that is part of our visual apparatus and how our brains perceive um, things like objects and color so a specular highlight is a place on an object in a photo uh, that seems to be in direct line of the light rays the photons that are coming off of a particular light source so uh, on the left hand side if we take a look at that we can see that there are specular highlights on essentially the the places where the light source is striking most direct, which would be here on the forehead, on her cheekbone, on her nose. We have these glares, essentially, right? Light, light glares. Um, now, when you change the light source, you change the specular highlights. So we can see, and you probably can do this without even really thinking about it, when we see that there's a, a, a glare here and a glare on the nose and a glare on the cheekbone, we innately and distinctly are able to tell as human beings that the light source must be somewhere up off in this direction, up in front of Amber, higher than her head, and the, the light photons are coming down and they're bouncing off and they're coming off into the camera um, uh, uh, light receptor in this case, or uh, photoreceptor in this case. Now, if we change the light source, we change the specular highlights, meaning that if there was suddenly a specular highlight over here, then we would know, first of all, we'd be able to see this side of her face lit more evenly, and we would say, okay, there's a second light source. Um, specular highlights are related to shadows, and shadows and specular highlights must agree in order for us to be able to essentially make visual sense of an image. So we can see that this part of her face is in shadow. There's a shadow here under the jaw. That tells us that the light source is above her head. This tells us that the light source is on our, as we're viewing this image, our left, it would be Amber's right, uh, and so on. Now she claimed that this image was taken after uh, she turned on the vanity lights, and she said that there's more of a yellow hue. Um, and it is true that color temperature in a, in a light source will most definitely affect the color appearance of subjects and objects in, a, in an image. Uh, but it does also change the specular highlights. And I know that vanity mirrors, and I assume that this is what she's talking about. Because she mentioned when she said uh, the uh, makeup lights, she indicated with her hands, you know, the lights that go around. Um, and that's a fairly classic sort of, uh, sort of setup for a makeup mirror. So something like... Uh, this or thereabouts, right? Maybe not exactly this, but thereabouts. Well, um, what that would do is that provides more even light. There's a reason why it goes all the way around the mirror. It's so that the face can be lit evenly from all directions. And they do typically, I should say classically, have more of a yellow temperature in terms of, uh, of, their, of the temperature of the lights themselves, the color of the light that comes out. Um, but this is not evenly lit. This is the same specular highlight and shadow agreement as we see in the picture on the left, except it's more of a reddish yellowish tone. So that tells us that this is not a change in color temperature from the lighting. This is simply an alteration of the image. Whether or not it was done intentionally, that is the question. And I think that there is a plausible scenario where this was not done intentionally, um, but it was most definitely done. And claiming that they are two distinctly different images is obviously incorrect in this case, and at the at the very least, a misstep or misstatement from Amber Heard in those cases. Now, um, one thing we can't do is any of those advanced tests that I mentioned. So we can't do any error level analysis, noise analysis, PCA. We can't do a lot of really good forensic tests because um, these images are, and in, forensically speaking, they're garbage. Um, these are copies of copies of copies. Um, the, neither of these are our camera original. Um, and as I understand it, they were all retrieved from a cloud backup system, but I believe Mr. Neumeister goes into that. So let's return to, to Mr. Neumeister's testimony.
All right, could we pull up um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1306, Tom? And Your Honor, this is another video that, um, oh, can you pause that please? This is another video that we prepared. It's, it's not published yet, so I'm happy to play it once through. Um, uh, so that- Play it once through. This is What is your request? What exhibits are they? I'm sorry, Your Honor. What uh, exhibits are these that are in this video? It doesn't say, I don't okay. know. Yeah, I tried to get my question out a moment ago. Defendant 712 and 713, Your Honor. 1307 There is one more thing I'd like to mention in regards to um, compression and uh, JPEG images or lossy images. Uh, is that you recall uh, that uh, quantization tables are applied um, when uh, uh, two images when they are captured, um, and those quantization tables can be particular, or will be particular, I should say, um, to both cameras, makes and models, and uh, uh, photo editing software. So um, both of these images were imported into GIMP and exported. Here we have uh, one that is very high quality. This is ninety six percent. And here's the one that we exported that was around 30% or so. If we look at the quantization tables, uh, we can see how that changes with compression as well. This is how quality is calculated in lossy uh, format images. Note that the uh, although the values in the quantization table are different, uh, the values will be mathematically related, and although the comment does not have uh, a quantization table, it doesn't say GIMP, there seems to be some kind of a problem here, uh, this normally would indicate uh, the uh, software version that was used, because the quantization tables uh, can be traced back to camera make models and to different versions of different photo editing softwares in uh, a process that we call in the forensic uh, a uh, game of forensic iconography, what we call in forensic iconography, quantization fingerprinting. Okay, 1306 then will be as identified public. And if we could go ahead and play that, please. Um, Tom? And Mr. Neumeister, um, what's your, um, wh what do we see here in this demonstrative? Um, there's uh, exhibit 712, I believe you have, I'm not sure the Bates number, 712 and 713. Uh, they're two separate exhibits, except it's the exact same photograph that's been, uh, one's been edited, one hasn't, or I can't say that one hasn't, but uh, the colors have been uh, modified in an editor. So the reason that Mr. Neumeister uh, can't say that one has not is because of the provenance of the images. Uh, he has no camera original image to work with. Um, so without a camera original image, we don't know what the original image necessarily looked like. So um, both of the images could have been edited, and he, he would not be able to tell. Um, that uh, That is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean we can't tell that an image has been edited. We just simply can't say that one has not. Um, it's a it's a sort of a fine distinction, but it is an important one, at least from the perspective of a forensic practitioner and Mr. Neumeister here, because verifying authenticity is a critical, often first step in this process. And without that, it really undermines a lot of this certainty that would otherwise be available to us in an examination. We can still examine the images, we can still come to certain conclusions, but it really throws out a lot of what might be possible with an authentic image to start with. Objection, Your Honor, uh, beyond the scope of your ruling, talking about colors, it keeps happening. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Neumeister, um, did you form an opinion in this case about the authenticity of the photos that you review, re reviewed of Ms. Heard? Well, First of all, you can't, I can't, nobody can identify 
the authenticity of the photos, of any of the photos. Marked photos three, photos one, or just marked with the operating system number. And the reason is the manner of collection. So these came from an iTunes backup. Now, what is an iTunes backup? It's Jackson, not- Your Honor, I'm, I'm sorry. You're on the scope of your ruling. EXIF metadata, this keeps happening. Your Honor, may I approach on this one? Yep, and there we have it. That is exactly uh, the problem here in this case. So just because an image is visually identical to another image doesn't mean it's forensically identical to another image. Cloud backups do not take the original image and move them up to the cloud. They copy data up to the cloud. It would be impossible for them to move the original in some fashion. Now, can those copies be forensically identical to those that were taken on the device itself? Theoretically, Yes, um, what, what that would require is essentially a perfect bitstream copy that would essentially be making a forensic copy of every image that gets uploaded to the cloud. But that would be terribly inefficient for these services. So often what's done is, well, number one, when you configure a cloud backup for your photos, and you may have done this yourself, uh, you may be able to choose a quality to retain. And even if you change it to the highest possible quality, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be a one for one bitstream copy. Now, second of all, is even if it is a perfect copy, a forensic copy of the, the photos that are being uploaded, we still may not be able to determine authenticity because doing so makes a copy. And unless there is some kind of verifiable trail, a chain of custody that is established, then a copy of an original photo is still must still be considered a copy, a non-camera original image unless we have an established chain of custody to show that it is indeed forensically identical, which means that we would still need the original image in order to, to conduct that verification absent of any uh, known documented business processes that a cloud service provider may offer to uh, essentially attest to the veracity integrity uh, of their, of their process. Right. So, and that would simply never happen. So, um, cloud storage is great for retaining your data across multiple devices. So you don't lose anything in case your phone is smashed or you smash your phone or, um, whatever. Um, but it is, uh, it is not, not at all, uh, the same, uh, same ballpark in terms of, but it is not at all the same ballpark in terms of, uh, forensic evidence at all. So, Mr. Neumeister, um, without going into the specifics, what's your opinion about the authenticity of the photos you received from Ms. Hurd? Based on the way they were collected, there would Objection, be Objection, no... Your Honor. We just ruled on this. I framed my question, I thought, Your Honor, to avoid the issue that you're concerned about. Mr. Neumeister, what's your opinion about the authenticity here? There's no way for any forensic expert to validate any of these photos. Okay. Thank you very much. No further questions. Okay. Yep, that is, that is correct. Also a good answer. Good afternoon, Mr. Neumeister. Good afternoon. Um, your only degree is in political science, correct? 42 years ago, correct. And you have no degree whatsoever from any academic institution in computer science, correct? That's correct. And you have no certification. So this is actually interesting, and this is an absolute, um, this is an absolute uh, a quintessential problem. Uh, here with uh, with the legal process, or, or I should say, with the process of, of expert testimony, one of the one of the shortcomings we have with the current expert testimony um, uh, basis, uh, which would be the the Daubert test and the Kumho Tire extension, which um, sets forth certain requirements for experts to be admitted as experts. In this case, uh, one of the indications of uh, well, and of course, Federal Rule of Evidence seven hundred two when it comes to um, expert testimony as well. Now seven hundred two. Um, actually tells us that there are different criteria that may qualify somebody as an expert. And educational background and training is only two of many of those. And it does include, as well, experience in this as well. Now, obviously, an expert witness, what you would really, really want to see is somebody who has certifications, uh, who has even publications, uh, a long work history, and degrees in whatever they're, they're testifying to. But just because they don't have that doesn't necessarily mean that it rules out them as an expert witness. Um, uh, the other problem that I'm seeing here um, is that 
what the attorney for Miss Hurd, who is now cross-examining Mr. Neumeister here, um, what he had just asked is whether or not he had any educational background in computer science. And that itself is revealing of one of the problems here with expert testimony and our legal process. The attorney is now asking if he is certified or educated in an area that has absolutely nothing to do with image forensics whatsoever. Computer science is a discipline that does not encompass all of computing knowledge. That is ludicrous. Computer science is a very narrow field which studies computing and would have nothing to do with the forensic process or forensic tests at all. What he should be asking for, of course, is you don't have a degree in computer forensics, but he cannot ask that question because the number of programs available out there for computer forensics is I know of two of them in the world. So we have to rely on individuals like Mr. Neumeister who have a degree 42 years ago in political science, um, but have been practitioners in the field for many decades. Um, although again, how many of those were as a forensic practitioner and how many of those were simply as a photographer or videographer in my mind is still a little bit muddy, but there you have it. So the, the question, you don't have any degrees in computer science. Well, of course not. He doesn't have a degree in culinary arts either. It doesn't make any difference. They're completely different fields in computer forensics, correct? That's correct. Now, I thought earlier he did say that he did have a certification in computer forensics, but he just answered, no, I don't. So I'm wondering if maybe I misunderstood Mr. Neumeister before or if Mr. Neumeister understood the, misunderstood the question now. Um, I do know that he said he did have certifications. Maybe he was referring to certifications in audiology or uh, photography or something like that. Um, or maybe, I, again, maybe I just misunderstood. From the opinions you've testified today, you relied on no data except for the embedded EXIF metadata to support those opinions, correct? Incorrect. What other data did you rely on for the opinions you've testified to today? I was trying to explain that nope. you kept it. What data. other data did you rely on for the actual opinions you've been able to testify to today besides EXIF metadata? The type of extraction that was performed? You're asking the question. For the actual that, opinions you, del you testified to. That is what I would use. I would also use vector scopes. Objection, Your Honor. That's, that was not responsive to my question, Your Honor. If you want to approach. Um, so what we're clearly dealing with here, well, at least in my opinion, I won't say clearly because maybe it's not so clear, but it seems to me um, from observing uh, this, this line of questioning here um, that Ms. Hurd has presented what seems to be an inexperienced attorney here uh, in offering cross-examination of Mr. Neumeister. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand the question that he's asking. Mr. Neumeister was, in fact, uh, answering the question that was being asked. So the question that was being asked, actually, we can go back and we can listen to it ourselves. To. You're asking the question for the actual that opinions you del you testified performed to today. Data did you rely opinions you testified to today? Incorrect. What other data did you rely on for the opinions you testified to today? So, what other data did you rely on for the opinions that you testified to today? Well, uh, of course, he did mention the EXIF data, so, but that was not material to this particular question. So from my perspective, watching Mr. Neumeister's testimony, not having read his report, of course, I, again, I'm going at this from the same amount of information that any casual observer would have from watching this trial. Uh, Mr. Neumeister uh, seemed to rely on EXIF information, and from the evidence that's been presented so far, the testimony that's been presented so far, it seems as if Mr. Neumeister primarily relied on EXIF information for his analysis. However, Mr. Neumeister also conducted observational analysis using scientific uh, equipment and techniques like vector scopes, RGB parade, uh, waveform scopes, and so on. Luminance scopes he also mentioned before. Now, I have not seen uh, him testify or present anything in his testimony or demonstrables that suggests that there was any anything included about luminous scopes or vector scopes or any of those other scientific tests. Um, but that is the answer to the question. What other information have you relied on to form your opinion? Well, he did EXIF data, but what else has he relied on? Well, he's relied on observation uh, using scientific instruments like vector scopes and et cetera.
But the attorney doesn't seem to understand what he's asking and doesn't understand even the beginning of Mr. Neumeister's uh, um, reply. And the reason that I believe that this may be an example of an inexperienced attorney on Mr. Hurd's side um, is because um, he seems to be jumping very quickly on Mr. Neumeister, not giving him an opportunity really to reply, immediately assuming that he's being non-responsive, uh, which seems to me like more or less of a, of a kind of a rookie mistake, wanting to uh, make sure that you do a good job, but maybe being a little bit too hard on what is an expert witness. He's not being hostile and he is attempting to answer the question that said throughout his testimony so far, Mr. Neumeister has struck me as not, not I don't, again, not to disparage Mr. Neumeister at all. Um, not even a little bit. However, uh, Mr. Neumeister's responses have not always been very concise or direct. And I don't think that that's any attempt to be deceptive in this case. I think Mr. Neumeister is probably very nervous. Uh, and maybe this is not the kind of thing, as he mentioned, he consults on cases all the time, but very few of them actually go to trial. So he may simply not have that much experience being an expert witness. And I can't blame him. I would be the same way. I was trying to explain that you kept it. What other data did you rely on for the actual opinions you've been able to testify to today besides EXIF metadata? The type of extraction that was performed? You're asking the question for the actual of that? opinions you, del you testify to. That is what I would use. I would also use vector scopes. Objection, Your Honor. That's, that was not responsive to my no, question. That is the answer to the question, sir. <laughs> Even Mr. Neumeister is like, this kid won't let me talk. <laughs> or you can answer that. Sir, you can answer that question. All right. Pardon? Judge comes in. You can that. answer the question. Oh, now he's like, can what's the question? The question? <laughs> uh, I don't recall a question, Your Honor. We can move on. Your Honor, maybe we could have the court reporter read it back. They could redirect. No. What was the question, Judy? <laughs> I believe the question was, what methodology did I use to make my findings? Judy's voice has changed. That's... <laughs> Sorry. Is that correct, Judy? Okay. The attorney should know the question that he asked. He should have it written in front of him. That's fine. Okay. So when you're analyzing video or photo in this objection case, to video, your honor, that's beyond the scope. All right. If you could just answer the question, sir. When you're analyzing a photo, a digital photo, you look at the EXIF data, you use a vector scope, you can use a Pantone chart if that's available, and that should be done, but that's a whole different deal. If I go into that. So a Pantone chart is a color chart. Uh, let me see if I can find mine quickly. All right, this will have to do. So Pantone colors, uh, this is a Pantone chart. Pantone, if you're not familiar, uh, is an organization that, that organizes and categorizes colors. They come out with their own colors all the time. So um, Pantone, for example, 100 would be this particular shade of yellow. Pantone 170 would be this particular shade of salmon, pink, orange, whatever, um, and so on. So Pantone charts uh, are just a way of doing color matching and um, so for example, if we have two images as we did before, right? So if we were to quantify the, the color schemes available here, if we were to say, um, let's take a single pixel somewhere here that would match maybe, maybe that would match Pantone 155. And if we were to take a, so actually, hold on, let me, let me actually do this uh, a little bit here. And I wouldn't be doing it here in a, a PDF reader. I would never, if someone, if I'm doing image analysis and someone hands me a PDF, I hand it right back. I will not analyze PDFs. This is not an image file format. Uh, this is not evidence as far as I'm concerned. This is a representation of evidence. Um, so uh, anyway, if we were to take a single pixel here and we were to match that up, we might say, okay, this is somewhere, let's say Pantone 155 or Pantone 163. 
but if we were to examine another image and take that exact same pixel again in orientation, um, these would all be vectorized. So we'd be able to identify individual pixels. We might say, okay, well, that's closer to a uh, Pantone 157 or a 150 um, and do, do color matching in that fashion. So when did that you'll object to it? That, by the way, is, a, is an extreme uh, reductive uh, explanation of what, what he's talking about here. Again, uh, forensic iconography is an incredibly complicated and precise process. And when describing it, it sounds like, you know, this is really simple, easy stuff. Um, but uh, I, I tr uh, there's far more to it than I'm letting on. I'm just attempting to describe what he's talking about here. To it. So you'd also use a waveform scope. You would use an RGB parade. You can use... All right, one at a time here. So a waveform in an image is essentially... Um, Okay, let's start with a let's start with a wave form. So, a uh, part of uh, when when JPEG compression occurs, that compression algorithm is either going to be a discrete cosine transform or a discrete wavelet transform. A wavelet could be considered one individual broadcast of particular image data. So, let's say that we have. Um, an image that is 800 pixels by 600 pixels. Well, 800 times 600 is uh, 40, uh, 480,000. Um, and what that means is that there are 480,000 wavelets, wavelets, not waveforms, wavelets in uh, the image. So a waveform would be a one, one discrete portion of those wavelets that make up a uh, a significant portion of visual image data. And one of the forensic tests that we can do for image forgery detection is known as wavelet transform, which means that essentially we take a discrete number of waveforms and compare them at different levels in an image to see um, if it is an image composite. So what that means is, let's say that, what, what does an image look like if we are viewing only 1% of the visual image data? What does it look like when we're looking at 10% of the available data? 30%, 50%, 70%, 100%. And that will give us different visual representations to look at. It's all about essentially not allowing our eyes to be fooled by the picture itself and looking at the way the picture is made up. Um, by essentially reducing the amount of information that we have input into our into our eye, um, so a uh, waveform. All right, so a waveform scope and uh, a waveform can represent um, different parts of visual image data. So it could be chrominance, it could be luminance. Um, but for example, uh, as Adobe has here in image analysis tools, a Luma waveform scope. Um, is used to, just as we saw with a, a vector scope, uh, here's RGB Parade, uh, here's a vector scope. Actually, you know what, I could use this for all of them. So, um, yeah, a waveform scope here, and in the case of what's provided here from a, in Adobe's uh, page here, um, <clears throat> is essentially a representation of waveform data. It could be luminance, it could be chrominance, but in this case it's luminance. Um, will allow you to identify um, the uh, the spikes and waveforms in an image and how they are represented. So what this is, is if we are looking at an image, there's going to be places that are darker and places that are lighter. And if we, if we take a 2D image that we're looking at on a screen, what if we could see it on a 3D plane and we turned it so we were looking at the image on its edge? And the darker parts were holes or pits and valleys. And the lighter parts, the, the more bright parts, were mountains, right, in the image. And it was represented in that fashion. That would be the Luma waveform. For color waveform, it's what we see here with an RGB parade. It's just the different chrominance levels for the different color streams in the image as well. With a vector scope, we have a different representation. Instead, we have essentially what is a scatter plot of uh, the the visual image data, whether it's RGB, uh, hue light saturation, or U, uh, uh, UV, uh, e, sorry, YUV. Um, it could be represented as plots on a point uh, emanating out from a center, which represents um, essentially disparity of values in the image along that vector.
can use a histogram, though in this case, it's not really all that relevant. Um, so he said that in this case, it's not all that relevant, and that, that would be true. The reason that we would it's not relevant um, is because while these uh, different tests, vector scopes and uh, so on, a histogram. So the reason he said that it's not all that relevant is that all of these different tools are different ways of representing the same visual image data. It's just a way of kind of cutting through the noise that may be available. And it is a good way of comparing images, but in this case, uh, it's not necessary because the images are visually apparently different. Uh, they are they are not similar enough to even warrant any question as to whether or not they have been altered. They most certainly have. Um, that is, in my opinion, indisputable given everything. Not not just the EXIF data because that couldn't be altered, uh, but they're visually different. They aren't the same, um, right? These are definitely not the same image. Um, although they are the same image because they have the same visual representation of subject. It's just that one of them has definitely been altered. So that's not a question. It's a question of whether or not it was intentional, but that's not what, um, Mr. Neumeister is testifying to. He cannot testify to that because the provenance of the image, uh, images are so blown out of the water that he could not even tell you, um, very much of anything about the provenance of the image, the authentic authenticity of the images. You are not offering any opinions that any photovac photograph in this case was intentionally modified by Ms. Hurd, correct? I'm just stating the fact that photographs were modified. But So you are not offering any opinion that any photograph in this case was intentionally modified by Ms. Hurd, correct? That's correct. Yes. So the images have been altered. I cannot tell who altered them. I do not have that information. You cannot tell who did that with the evidence that's available because the provenance is so messed up. There's no authenticity here. The images are visually similar. Um, one of them has been altered or both of them have been altered. So yeah, that's where we're at. And he probably Can you should have rested on exhibit that question. 170A? He should have rested on that question, in my opinion. Is that defendant's 170? Defendant's 170, yes, Your Honor. So you offer testimony regarding this photograph during the direct examination, right, Mr. Neumeister? There's that that's a yes or no, sir. Uh, the photograph like that, I, I don't exactly remember the uh, photograph. There's so many different versions of this photograph, but yes, I, I talked about that particular photograph. But on, uh, do you recall being deposed in this matter? Yes. And you were under oath? Yes. And that was on April 6, 2022? I believe. May I approach your Yes, sir. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Neumeister, if you could please turn to page 76. And when I say pages, those are the little pages in the four boxes, not the oh, page gotcha. at the top. And do you see page 76, line three? You were asked on April 6, anywhere in your April 1st, 2022 expert disclosure, do you offer any opinions regarding the authenticity or lack of authenticity of the specific photograph produced as ALH 7101? Response, can I refer to my report to see if that specific number is in the report? Yes. Response, not that specific photo. I just grabbed three out of the batch. Do you see that? Yes. Can you please pull up exhibit 517, or defendants 517? Thank you. So it sounds like Mr. Neumeister was presented with a tremendous number of images potentially to analyze, and rather than analyze them all, just grabbed a few out of the batch. That's not necessarily a problem. Um, it really depends on the circumstances of uh, well, exactly what uh, is uh, is being tested, really. And so it might be appropriate if all he's doing is um, is doing a, a sample, let's say, to 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 ascertain you know image formats, timelines. Um, uh, judging general quality of the samples or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I do think it's a little bit odd. Um, but again, I don't know exactly what he was presented with and I don't know exactly what he was trying to ascertain. So maybe that will be revealed here shortly. Can you please pull up exhibit 517? 
or defendants 517. Thank you. You are not offering any opinions regarding this specific photograph, right, Mr. Neumeister? That's correct. My testimony has been limited here. So it sounds like Mr. Neumeister did write an extensive, more extensive report than he's being um, allowed to. And you are not offering any opinion that any photograph was visually doctored by Amber, correct? Not by, I can't put the person uh, who might have done it. Well, you're not offering an opinion that a photo was visually doctored by anybody, are you? I'd have to see each photo. There's no way to authenticate any of these photos based on what I received. That's a good answer. That's true. So you testified about photos three. Do you recall that testimony? Correct. Yeah, photos three is a photo editing and photo sorting application, correct? It's a photo editor and photo sorter as, as are a number of editors. So when you reference photos 3.0, you never did any independent research. Um, strike that, Your Honor. So when the, when the software of a photograph in the EXIF metadata says Photos 3.0, that could be just saying that the photo was saved in Photos 3.0, correct? Unless you looked at a scope of the photos, that would tell you that the parameters of the photo do not meet that of the cell phone that it was taken on. Right. So what Mr. Neumeister is saying here is that, yes, exactly as I demonstrated before, if you bring a photo into a photo editor and save it, it will change the EXIF data even if there has been no actual alterations done, or I should say no intentional alterations done to the image. However, Mr. Neumeister is kind of, it sounds like he's kind of shying away from uh, from any testimony that may muddy the waters in terms of, well, images may be automatically edited in some fashion when imported into a photo editing program like Photos 3. Um, which I guess I will leave up to, you know, each and I'll leave up to everyone else to, to form their own opinion on that. Um, but I mean, it is, it is, yes, something that, that, you know, when you take a picture with your phone and then you open it up in photos three or whatever photo image editor, uh, it may make alterations automatically, you know, um, it will, it will do that. But the notation Photos 3.0 in the software EXIF metadata, that does not in and of itself mean that the photo was edited in Photos 3.0, correct? It means that you've recompressed the photo and it will not hash or digitally fingerprint with the original photo. But yes, that's correct. So an image when taken with your cell phone is going to have one hash value because they are highly deterministic. So the camera original will have one hash. Uh, and then if brought into a photo editor, even if there's no alterations made to the photo and it's merely exported. The process of compression changes the data enough uh, to the point where it is no longer um, forensically identical. All right, so if I bring up hash my files here, I can show you. Um, uh, let's see, let's drop this one in here and let's grab the other two that we had created. And this one. All right, so uh, so as you can see here, uh, let me throw all of these back up the way they were. Here is our uh, apparent camera original, or close closest to camera original in terms of the three that we're working with. This is the one uh, that was brought into GIMP and then exported without any alterations. And this is the one that was compressed to around 30% and brought it and uh, saved from GIMP. They are visually identical, but they are forensically different. And they, they are forensically different because of this hash value. So here we have the MD5 hash calculation from our images. This is our camera original. This is the one that was brought into GIMP, but not altered. And this is the one that was compressed severely. You can see the hash value for all three of them is different. And hash values are the essence of forensic uh, distinction as far as digital evidence goes. A hash value is a hash value, and if hash values are different, then that is different data, even if they are visually identical, if they represent the same subject and so on. Um, that said, um, there's plenty of reasons why hash values might change, right? Intentional alteration is not necessarily one of them, although intentional alteration will certainly do that as well. MD5 hashes are, sorry, hashes are meant to be highly deterministic. So even a small, tiny change, imperceptible, um, is made, it will dramatically change the outcome of the hash value. 
That's why we rely on them for forensic distinction. Uh, but that also means that there is a practical limitation where if I were on a computer system and I saw this image and then I saw this image and then I saw this image, well, forensically they are different, but practically they are the same. So we, we rely on hash values uh, for forensic, uh, 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 to establish forensic identicalness. Um, but there are other considerations, right? Data is not just data. So as Mr. Neumeister said before, data is data and it doesn't take a side. Yeah, uh, data is data, but it's not as simple as that because this data says these are different images. Practically speaking, they are visually identical. So for practical purposes, they are the same image. And that's another one of the problems we have with conveying digital evidence in court in this fashion, because this is a very fine distinction for uh, the average juror to be expected to make. But it does not mean in and of itself that it was visually edited in any way in Photos 3.0, correct? Again, it's not the same photo because you're using lossy compression once you save it. So it, you have changed the photo. So Mr. Neumeister's not wrong. You do change the photo. They're visually identical, but at a data level, the photo is changed. They're not the same photo. So if you could please turn to page 233 of that transcript. And line 20, do you see question? When it says exit software, okay, photos 3.0 onto 234. That's just saying it was saved in Photos 3.0, right? Response, saved in 3.0, that's correct. Question, that notation in and of itself does not mean that the photo was edited in 3.0, right? Answer, that's correct. Did I read that correctly? Yes. A file has not changed visually just because it has been processed through Photos 3.0, correct? That's incorrect. Uh, can you look at page 128 of your deposition, please? bottom line 20 question you see question so the only thing that i may have uh done the mr newmeister i don't know if he did or not he may have um impossible for me to tell i don't have his report um but what i would have done certainly uh is i would have um gotten um an iphone 6 i believe it was running 931 um, with photos 3 and i would have run some tests of my own i would have taken pictures with the camera um i would have uh, done some editing of some of them in Photos 3. I would have compared um, the way images uh, come out as a result of operating these these devices um, just to see if changes were made just by importing these photos. Uh, and again, maybe Mr. Neumeister did that. In fact, I, I expect that he has. He seems like he's he's a competent professional. Um, so I'm going to take for, for granted that he may have done that and he just wasn't allowed to, to present that information. And, but the file changed visually just because it is it has been processed through Photos 3.0. Answer, you know, obviously I understand what you're asking. From a technical point, yes, because of the compression. You get down to scopes and artifacts, yes, it has changed. Was it intentionally changed? We don't know. In other words, did somebody save it in there and just save the photo? We don't know. Did I read that correctly? That's correct. But again, it says so here... Just, that was my question, Mr. Newmeister. Okay. So if the EXIF metadata software field lists the software as iOS, you have no reason to dispute that, correct? Incorrect. Well, isn't data data? That's what you testified to, right? It's very simple to modify EXIF data. And he's right about that. It is, it's, they're just attributes. It's just metadata. Um, it can absolutely be, be edited or changed uh, later on. Um, so when establishing the, the provenance of images, EXIF data is only an indicator. It's not necessarily the end-all be-all, as I mentioned before. It, it's, I mean, Did you, you find any evidence phone. in this case of actual modification of EXIF metadata? You can't, you can't authenticate any of these photos because of the way they were. That wasn't my question, Mr. Neumeister. Did you find any evidence of any modification of EXIF metadata of any photograph in this case? You didn't listen to my answer. Uh, see, Mr. Neumeister is making something of a little bit of a mistake here. Um, as, uh, as a factual witness or an expert witness, um, you have to answer the questions that you're asked. It's not 
Uh, it's not your job as the expert witness to answer, answer the question that sh you should have been asked or that you wish you had been asked. Um, if you're being asked an imprecise question, you're going to have to give an imprecise answer. That's just simply the way the legal system works. And you have to hope uh, that the attorney that will either cross-examine you or redirect you, whatever the case may be, um, is smart enough and savvy enough to refocus that question. And if not, um, you you do what you can do. You know, so Mr. Mr. Neumeister here to the question of whether or not he found any evidence, any modification of EXIF data should have been simply no or uh, no, but I was not asked to look at that, whichever the case may be. To my answer, my answer is there is no way to know because of the way the files were presented. So you felt, but you actually, you found no actual evidence of it, correct? That no one could. I'm not asking way. anyone else could, Mr. Neumeister. I'm asking, did you yourself? Find, you, you found no evidence of any modification of me EXIF metadata of any photograph in this case, correct? Now, I understand trying to control the narrative, but there's no way to answer that scientifically because given the evidence we were given, there is no way to positively or negatively answer that. It's not a question that can be answered. It, is, it is a question, Mr. Neumeister. The question is, did you yourself, you found no affirmative evidence of any modification of software EXIF metadata of any photograph in this case, correct? You you found no actual evidence of that, did you? No one could tell either way because- I'm not asking about anyone else, Mr. Neumeister, I'm asking about you. Did you, you found no evidence of that, did you? Objection, Your Honor, asked and answered. He's, he's not answered what he found, Your Honor. Overruled. There's not a way to answer that the way you're asking the question. You have to restate it. And Ask the question you're, you're being answered. Your Honor, he's not responding to the question. Right, could you just answer yes or no, sir, to the question? It's not a yes or no question. Did they, you, yes or no, you found, you found no evidence of EXIF metadata modification of any photograph in this case, correct? That's incorrect. Okay. It is your opinion that the metadata of all photographs of purported injuries that Ms. Hurd has identified as her trial exhibits do not indicate that the photographs went through a photo editing application, correct? Well, uh, no, first no, of all, I say that would be incorrect. That's not a yes or no question because a lot of the exhibits that you have. It is a yes or no question. Uh, he, he simply asked if there was any evidence that any of the photos went through an, a photo modification or editing application. Uh, the answer to that is uh, yes, there were a significant number of images that had photos three as the operating system or as the software version, I should say, um, and that isn't an image editing application. It doesn't necessarily mean that the images were intentionally edited or altered in order to affect some particular outcome, but that is an image editing application. They were imported into that, and that is a yes answer. Um, put up, they're not photographs, they're screen grabs. And they've been changed from a uh, uh, Apple format, which is JPEG, J -A JPEG, to a JPG Microsoft format. So you have actually changed the exemplars. You've changed the data yourselves. The, uh, we actually ran uh, EXIF data on some of your own examples that you've entered in the evidence. They are not photos from an iPhone. Those were edited in a PC. Yeah, this is another big problem here with the, the legal process not the legal process necessarily, but the process of expert testimony. Experts will examine evidence that is presented that was gathered during the process of discovery by attorneys. So an expert will simply have what is available to them in order to draw their conclusions. And unfortunately, not a lot of attorneys or even just different components of the legal process uh, have the personnel or knowledge to correctly handle certain types of evidence. Um, and this is particularly true with digital evidence because for the layperson, if you give somebody uh, a thumb drive or something with the files on it, they say, here's the files, analyze them without realizing that there's no chain of custody. There's no way to establish any kind of provenance. It's not even the same data. It's a copy of a copy of the data. Um, and it is, it, is, it is a major problem, um, you know, because it's just a disconnect in the way uh, this type of relationship has germinated, I guess, uh, over time. Um, so it is, it is something that Mr. Neumeister here is correctly identifying. Um, you know, the, the, the data that he was provided was dirty data. And if you get garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. And he simply cannot uh, ascertain what they're asking based upon what he was presented. That's just not possible. 
I'm going to uh, hand up a page from your disclosure. So do you see on page eight of your disclosure, Mr. Neumeister, it states, quote, the, the metadata of all of the photographs of purported injuries that Ms. Hurd has identified as her trial exhibits do not indicate that the photographs went through a photo editing application. Did I read that correct? That's correct. No further, we're talking no further questions. Yeah, all right, redirect. Mr. Neumeister. Um, yes. A moment ago, Mr. Murphy was asking you some questions about your opinion about the trial exhibits that Ms. Hurd has offered in this matter. Um, and he asked you about your opinion that they don't indicate that they've gone through a photo editing application. What can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, on this last exhibit, it says metadata, not EXIF data. So that's two different things altogether. We're talking EXIF. Mm, not really. Uh, we're splitting hairs here. EXIF data, again, is extended image format data. It is metadata. Um, but metadata also includes, you know, basic uh, information about the file that would be in any file system, something like the Mac time and so on is also considered metadata. They're definitely not discrete. Extended image format data is just an extension of existing metadata. So just adding additional attributes um, and allowing you to fill in those those attributes with whatever information is necessary or, or available on the, uh, on the image itself. Um, it was never really meant to be, I mean, just like everything else having to do with forensics, it wasn't designed as a forensic tool. It was just a way to assist um, people in organizing photos, really, essentially more than anything else, or assisting photographers in being able to identify images. Um, as Mr. Neumeister testified before, in the old days, you would have to write that information down. So extended image format data was just a digital way of handling that automatically as a convenience feature. So it is metadata. Or I guess I guess this is a sort of a chicken and egg situation where it should say that all EXIF data is metadata, but not all metadata is EXIF data. I guess is uh, one way of putting it. But there's certainly not discrete things. I would say that it's a, um, a semantic argument at best to say that the metadata and EXIF data are different things. EXIF data, and on the report I put metadata because. I was requested to cover meta and exit data. So it's taken out of context. The exit data is the data based that's embedded in the photo. Metadata can be the file data about the file itself, two different things. So yeah, to say that it's embedded in the data like that is something again of a, uh, of a misnomer, something of a, of a, uh, I suppose, again, a semantic argument. Um, I mean, it's true that file metadata, such as the Mac time, the modified time, the created time, access time, um, that will change more frequently in an operating system, whereas EXIF data should remain relatively static on an image unless the image itself is processed or altered or the EXIF data is particularly targeted for alteration in some, some aspects. Um, but it, it's not embedded as in it's not part of the image. It's not... Um, unalienable or indivisible from the image. It is, it is discrete data that is associated with the image. Um, and maybe this is just a difference in the way that Mr. Neumeister and I see the way data is organized in an image. So uh, the way that I see data being organized in an image is there's going to be uh, raw image data and raw image data will be associated with any image regardless of the format. It doesn't matter if it's a TIFF, if it is a JPEG, if it is a PNG, if it is a GIF, or any other image type, there's going to be raw image data associated with it, right? Because that is what represents at a very um, low practical level. If we were to try and define what is a digital image, we would not be able to make that definition without some explanation of raw image data. JPEGs, PNGs, and TIFFs are the only file formats in common use that make use of EXIF data. So essentially, raw image data is associated with every image, but not but EXIF data is not associated with every image type. So we're talking about a subset of images. In addition to that, not every image format is lossy. JPEGs are lossy. PNG files are lossless, so they don't suffer the same uh, pro, uh, problems with artifacts and, and so on. So we have to know exactly what we're analyzing. We have to understand what the proclivities are with different image formats and so on. So it, it is, in my opinion, uh, definitely uh, incorrect to say that EXIF data is embedded in the image. It's not part of the image. Raw image data is raw image data. EXIF data is extra data that is associated with certain image types. So it's not at all sort of like a digital watermark or a fingerprint or anything like that it's not, not even close to that if it were 
then I would be more in agreement with Mr. Neumeister here and say that it is part of the, the image. So the way the data was collected, it was an iTunes backup is a backup. Objection, Your Honor. Backups outside the scope of Your Honor's ruling if beyond you, exit metadata. I think you opened the door on the, the uh, overruled the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead, Brian. An iTunes backup is only a backup of things that are on an iPhone that have not been deleted. It does not have the critical operating system. It doesn't have any of the files that would validate the path of a photograph in that phone. It does not have a lot of the log files. It does not have the Knowledge C database, which talks about usage of the phone and uh, the patterns of how data was handled. All it is is the photos you des decided to save, not the photos you deleted. So it's a very limited database. Uh, he's, okay, so, uh, no, not necessarily. Um, so how do I explain this without getting into how cloud services work? Uh, let's put it this way. Cloud backup. Whether it's uh, whether it's an Apple or or OneDrive or Google Drive or or any number of other potential services out there, all it does is makes a copy. It sends a copy of the data that's being backed up to a cloud server somewhere. It does not transfer the original, and he's correct in that because it's being transferred to another computer, it will not preserve the file structure. So the location of the photo, um, it doesn't, it, it's not as if there's a copy of the device itself up in the cloud. It's just transferring files, right? It's just copying files. Um, so what that means is that of course, because that copy has to exist somewhere in a file system, it'll have a new path, right? It'll have a new location, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the cloud service doesn't record the original location of the file. It, it may in fact do that as metadata. So it's data, metadata is data about data. So the cloud service may say that this file, let's say it's uh it's photo one dot JPEG um, is transferred up to the cloud. Part of that transfer may include the original location as slash photos slash camera slash uh, image one dot JPEG or something like that. So, um, and that depends entirely on the cloud service and the logs that are being kept and, and so on. Uh, but it's not uncommon to see something like that. So, uh, but yes, it, it is a copy of the image. It's not the original. And therefore, um, we, what we, the first thing we do if we're analyzing evidence that's been found up in the cloud is we try like hell to try and recover the original image on the device itself because uh, that is the, <laughs> the best evidence. That's the original evidence. It's still on the phone, even if we have a copy up in the cloud. It does not have a lot of the log files. It does not have the Knowledge C database, which talks about usage of the phone and uh, the patterns of how data was handled. All it is is the photos you dec decided to save, not the photos you deleted. So it's a very limited database. Um, again, Mr. Neumeister, Mr. Neumeister, it seems might be giving a far more technical answer than is warranted here as well. Um, so cloud services can contain data that was deleted off of a device. Cloud services copy information and they hold on to it. Um, and they're supposed to sync with a device, meaning that if you have a, if you take a picture with your phone and it's transferred to the cloud, if you later delete the, uh, photo from your phone, it should delete it from the cloud as well. That's the way the service is supposed to work. But what if you take a picture with your phone and it is copied up to the cloud and then you lose connectivity. So you're, you know, you, you're stuck in a cave and then you delete the, the photo from your phone, but it doesn't have a chance to connect to a data network in order to notify the cloud service that the device has deleted the, the picture. Uh, well, what that means is that the cloud service will still have a copy of that picture because it was never instructed to delete it. Um, also, as far as uh, his 
uh, d discussion of the log files and usage files and stuff. Well, yes, of course, uh, cloud services are completely different services. Um, they are synced to a phone. They are not part of the phone. And so any, any information as far as usage of the file or the device will be on the device. And any information on the usage of the photo in the cloud service will be with the cloud service. Without the system registry or without the system operating system, there's no way to tell because it's very easy to modify a, a photo on a phone and have it just read iOS 9.3.1. Yeah, so what he's talking about is, is authenticating the original image. Uh, what he's talking about now is authenticating the original image. We can't authenticate the original image unless we, we have the original image. And even better is to have it in situ, which means as recorded in place when it was discovered. Um, and on the device, we'll also have a usage uh, of the device, uh, usage logs and so on, um, that allow us to do what's known as a correlated usage pattern, which allows us to corroborate the creation and follow the lifetime of the evidence on the device. Although that is often not available to us. And so we can still, you know, conduct an investigation even without that information. But the more information we have in this regard, obviously the better, the more certain we can be. But with the actual phone, if you were able to get a hold of the actual phone, and in 95% of all cases we work, we have the actual phone. It doesn't matter if the, the phones are 10 years old or 20 years old, or I mean, not 20 years old, but 10 years old. The reason is if people have something they want to keep as evidence, they don't throw out their phones. They don't recycle their phones. They save their phones. So people ask how we're doing phones on 13 year old cases because people do not throw out evidence. They keep the phone. Uh, I, uh, again, not, not to impugn Mr. Neumeister here, certainly not, not going to do that, but, um, his, his testimony in this case is definitely straying into areas that, that seem to be, ah, um, speculative. Um, I mean, he's making inferences about individual behaviors based upon his experience running his private practice, which he's already admitted is a boutique practice and awful small. He hasn't given any uh, evidence as to being qualified in digital behavioral analysis and, and so on. So I, uh, everything he's saying right now with regards to people don't throw away their phones and they save them and, and so on. Uh, and is, I, I can tell you if he's giving anecdotal evidence, then my anecdotal evidence is that that is not true. Um, but, uh, I, I will say that in my case, I, I'd be willing to, um, to, to show some studies and, and do some research here on this area to show that that's not necessarily the case. He's, uh, at, at the very least, he's he's making some some he's speculating in my opinion here. So, so in a situation, situation like this, there, there are no forensic extractions. In, in fact, the extractions we were provided were backups of backups of iTunes uh, just exports. So it's so yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Now that said, Mr. Newmeister is uh, again a little bit incorrect here. Cloud forensics is a thing. Um, so even though we always want to examine the original evidence whenever possible, obviously there's plenty of cases where that's not possible and you can still conduct forensic analysis of items that you find on a cloud service. It can just, it's just that it leads you only so far, right? So cloud storage services will contain plenty of logs and plenty of their own usage statistics and, and so on and so forth. And all of that can be gathered and forensically analyzed so that even if we don't have the device, the cloud service provider may still record important information such as uh, the device's host name, IP, MAC address, and so on, so that we can say, well, the image no longer resides on the device, but the cloud evidence here, the, 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 the evidence that was collected at the cloud service fairly definitively can show that it came from a certain device. So, um, He's a little bit wrong about that, but I, he also did not testify to being a cloud forensic expert. Um, so it's possible that he's just speaking a little bit beyond his expertise here. It's third generation and there is no way to verify the file paths and the history of any single photo. That we Although he is right about this, as I said, garbage in, garbage out. So he, he may not be an expert in cloud forensics. However, uh, it's pretty clear that even if he were, he wouldn't be able to verify any of the authenticity of these images because he's not even dealing, he's not dealing with the evidence from the device. That's his expertise. 
he's not dealing with the evidence from the cloud service, which would be probably a little bit outside of his expertise, but most likely still perfectly competent to handle it. He's dealing with evidence that came from a device that came from the cloud storage service that was came through an intermediary and probably another intermediary, which was converted and saved. And, and then he eventually gets it through these attorneys. Um, and he's, you know, he can't do anything with it at that point, forensically trash. That we've looked at. No further questions, your honor. All right. Thank you, sir. You can have a seat in the courtroom where you're free to go. Thank you very much. All right. Your next witness. And that is the testimony of Mr. Neumeister. Uh, again, uh, I may have uh, picked some nits here on this one, but Mr. Neumeister did, did strike me as a, a competent professional, forensic professional. Um, it's true that he didn't seem to have all of the education and qualifications that one could possibly have as a forensic expert, but that's hardly necessary in order to be qualified and to give testimony in this fashion. His answers seemed to me to be largely 100% spot on um, with, with my own experiences. There were a couple of points where they deviated. Um, I think that Mr. Neumeister, as uh, a an expert witness, as a factual witness, um, um, he came across uh, great. Uh, he, he certainly came across as a competent person. Um, I think that his testimony might have been a little bit confusing, both for the attorneys and the judge, but also for the jury. So it could have been a little bit more concise and, and, and so on. But uh, it, to his credit, this is a very difficult thing to try to explain to people, uh, particularly if if this is your world and Mr. Neumeister strikes me, um, as a, a technical person, um, you know, I mean, a, a photographer, a videographer, definitely a creative person, but definitely a technical person as well. So this is just one of the pitfalls that you run into when you're providing this kind of testimony overall, though, I think he did an excellent job. Um, and as a professional, um, uh, or a fellow expert in this field, I found his testimony to be accurate and compelling, and I understood uh, what he was saying. And that's why I wanted to create this video, so that if you aren't from this world and you don't understand what he was saying, uh, maybe now you have a little bit better of an idea where he was coming from and what he was saying and what it, what it all means. So uh, that's all I wanted to say. Take care, and we will uh, see you around on the next one.